So good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, um, having me with you today. Uh, let me arrange differently there. My name is uh, uh, Baroni, Stefano Baroni from uh, Sista Trieste. And uh, uh, today I'm going uh, uh, to tell you about uh, 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 density functional perturbation theory. I think uh, the, the title uh, uh, on, uh, on the first, uh, on the first uh, uh, slide uh, uh, is wrong, but the presentation is hopefully uh, going to be right. So density functional perturbation theory, as uh, the name indicates, is all about uh, computing derivatives of, uh, uh, of observables with respect to the strength uh, of uh, some uh, external field to the st strength of some uh, perturbation. So quite generally, any physical property or most physical properties can be expressed uh, as the susceptibilities. So as the derivative of uh, the value of some quantum mechanical observable with respect uh, to the strength of, of some uh, external probe that uh, uh, describes uh, uh, the uh, experimental uh, uh, apparatus. So examples uh, of uh, uh, response functions uh, are, uh, for instance, uh, the um, atomic or molecular polarizability or uh, the dielectric constant, the uh, elastic constants uh, of uh, materials. Of course, uh, the polarizability is the derivative uh, of uh, the dipole uh, uh, with respect to an external electric field, uh, by the same token, uh, elastic constants are derivatives uh, of the stress tensor uh, with respect uh, to the magnitude of uh, the strain. Uh, uh, piezoelectric constants uh, are uh, derivatives uh, of the polarization with respect uh, uh, to, uh, to strain. So all these uh, are examples of uh, derivatives of macroscopic properties with respect to some uh, external field. But we can uh, uh, equally think uh, of derivatives of microscopic properties, such as, for instance, interatomic force constants uh, that, are, uh, deriva that are defined as the derivative of the force acting uh, on some atom when uh, an atom when a different atom is uh, displaced uh, of uh, equilibrium. As we will see, these uh, are uh, uh, the key quantities uh, to compute uh, for, uh, 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 for simulating uh, lattice vibration. Uh, also, uh, Born effective charges are uh, uh, defined similarly as derivatives with respect to atomic displacements, this time not uh, uh, of uh, the forces acting on individual atoms, but uh, of uh, the dipole of, uh, 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 of the system. So uh, let us see how, uh, how this uh, can be worked out uh, in practice. The basis uh, of uh, uh, all uh, uh, linear response and perturbation theory in, uh, uh, in many uh, quantum mechanical applications, including density functional theory, is the Hellman Feynman theorem. So the Hellman Feynman theorem can be uh, uh, stated uh, as follows. So suppose you have a Hamiltonian that depends parametrically on a parameter lambda. And with lambda here, I indicate, uh, for instance, uh, the strength of uh, an external perturbation. For instance, uh, the strength of an external uh, electric field. And of course, uh, uh, because uh, the Hamiltonian depends uh, on, uh, on lambda, also its uh, eigenfunctions, uh, uh, psi, depend uh, on lambda. Uh, the, so I indicate them as uh, psi or lambda, and so, uh, and so do uh, the corresponding uh, eigenvalues E of lambda. The uh, uh, the aim of the Hellman Feynman theory, uh, a theorem is to provide uh, a swift uh, uh, and convenient way of computing uh, the derivative of uh, this uh, eigenvalue 
with respect to the strength of the perturbation. So the usual, uh, the usual uh, textbook uh, uh, demonstration of this uh, theorem is uh, very simple. You express uh, the uh, eigenvalue as the expectation value of the Hamiltonian with respect uh, uh, to the parameter lambda. You apply the chain rule, and then uh, you observe uh, that uh, that uh, when uh, uh, here there is a prime that is missing. So the the first term here should read uh, psi prime h psi plus the psi h prime psi plus the psi uh, h psi prime. So the h takes out. A, uh, an eigenvalue of this uh, bracket. And so this term here is nothing but the eigenvalue times the derivative of psi psi, but psi psi is equal to one, is a constant, is the normalization of the wave function. And so we arrive at the conclusion that the derivative of the eigenvalue is the expectation value of the derivative of the Hamiltonian. So this is uh, uh, a particular uh, case uh, of a more general uh, uh, statement re uh, regarding uh, the uh, minima uh, of uh, functionals that depend uh, on a parameter lambda. Suppose you have, uh, you have uh, a, a functional uh, g that depends uh, on uh, some dynamical variable x and uh, uh, some uh, external uh, uh, parameters lambda. Of course, the minima with respect to x of this functional will depend on, uh, on lambda. And the question is uh, how to compute the derivative of the, lead of the minima as a function of lambda with respect to lambda. The solution is simple again. You have uh, to apply the chain rule. And the derivative of lowercase uh, 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 g is equal to the partial derivative of uh, uh, capital G with respect to X computed that minimum times the derivative of the position of the minimum with respect to lambda plus the partial derivative of G uh, uh, with respect uh, to lambda computed uh, at minimum. But the G over the X at the minimum is equal to zero because uh, of, the, uh, of the minimum condition. And so we arrive at the conclusion that uh, the total derivative of, uh, uh, of uh, the value of the functional at, uh, uh, with uh, at the minimum with respect to the external parameter is only equal to the value computed at the minimum of uh, the partial derivative. You have uh, no uh, contribution from the implicit dependence of the minimum upon the position of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the minimum itself. So you see that uh, if you, uh, sub if you uh, uh, think of uh, G of X and lambda as the expectation value of the Hamiltonian and you identify psi with uh, X, you arrive at the generalization of, uh, uh, of the traditional uh, Hellman Feynman theorem, which, however, holds in general. It holds for any functional of any variable, not only uh, as uh, it, it, uh, uh, apply not all, it applies not only as, uh, to the energy uh, as, a function, uh, uh, as a function of uh, the uh, uh, wave function. And we'll, uh, we will see that, in particular, it applies to uh, density functional theory, from which uh, we derive uh, a general perturbative approach to uh, density functional theory itself. So uh, our aim is to compute the susceptibilities, as, as we have seen. And uh, the most general abstract way of indicating a susceptibility that is the derivative of an observable B with respect to the strength of the perturbation uh, alpha, following, uh, uh, following uh, uh, the Hellman Feynman uh, theorem, you can express the expectation value of B as uh, the derivative of uh, uh, the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian with respect to a fictitious perturbation, uh, uh, capital, uh, uh, capital B, 
that couples to uh, the internal degrees of freedom uh, through the parameter beta. So this uh, you can think of uh, a reverse way of using Hellman Feynman. Hellman Feynman is usually used to compute the uh, derivative of the eigenvalue uh, as, uh, as, an expectation, uh, as an expectation value. Here we use the other way around. We use Hellman Feynman to express the expectation value as the derivative of the uh, of uh, an eigenvalue. So by combining the Hellman Feynman theorem with uh, the expression of the susceptibility as the linear variation of the observable with respect to the strength of the perturbation, we arrive at uh, the important conclusion that the most general static susceptibility can be expressed always as the second derivative of the ground state Hamiltonian as, uh, uh, with respect uh, to the strength of two external parameters uh, that couple to the internal degree of freedom. The first external parameter alpha is uh, the physical coupling to the perturbation. The second parameter beta is uh, uh, the uh, uh, coupling to a fictitious uh, perturbation that is introduced uh, just for the sake of using Hellman Feynman and uh, for the sake of arriving at this important uh, uh, at this important uh, uh, expression of the susceptibility as uh, a, a second derivative of uh, uh, the energy. Because of this, of course, uh, we can uh, compute any static susceptibility with uh, quantum mechanical perturbation theory that allows us, by definition, by construction, to uh, compute uh, energy derivatives. And, uh, uh, and also, as we will see, uh, uh, with uh, uh, generalizations of uh, perturbation theory uh, from uh, uh, standard quantum mechanics uh, to uh, density functional perturbation theory. So let us see how energy derivatives can be uh, expressed in density functional theory. We suppose to have a Hamiltonian H naught that uh, couples uh, to uh, a number of external fields uh, uh, Vi uh, uh, with uh, a strength that uh, I indicate uh, generically as uh, uh, lambda uh, as lambda i. So uh, quite generally, we can express uh, the, uh, the energy as a function of uh, all of these uh, uh, parameters lambda i, and uh, uh, we can write down a formal Taylor expansion where uh, featuring linear terms, uh, quadratic terms, uh, and uh, higher order terms uh, that I will not indicate explicitly. Uh, the, the linear terms, uh, I have uh, indicated them uh, with uh, a negative sign uh, just to follow the convention that uh, the linear uh, terms uh, in, this, uh, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in these expansions are generalized forces, and forces in elementary uh, physics are defined as the negative of uh, the derivatives uh, uh, of the energy. And uh, so uh, minus F are the gradient. The gradient of uh, E of lambda with respect to lambda is exactly minus uh, the uh, generalized force. So the computation of, uh, 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 of forces uh, uh, is uh, the standard tool that allows us to do structural optimization and molecular dynamics. And uh, uh, because of Hellman Feynman, this can be computed uh, from any density functional theory computation uh, directly from ground state uh, uh, properties. You just compute uh, the ground state uh, uh, Consham orbitals. And from the ground state, the cone charm orbitals, you have direct access to the forces. So this is what enable, enable us to do uh, structural optimization and molecular dynamics uh, on the fly. The second derivatives 
as we have seen, give access to static response functions, such as the elastic constants, the dielectric tensor, the piezoelectric tensors, and you name it, any static response constant response function, as we have seen, uh, can be expressed in terms of second order derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to the, st the strength of external parameters. And also, extending this computation of uh, response functions from macroscopic uh, susceptibilities to microscopic quantities, uh, such as uh, the interatomic force constants and the Born effective charges, uh, this uh, generalization allows us, uh, as we will see in a while, to uh, compute uh, uh, vibrational frequencies uh, of uh, molecules. And, uh, and solids. So let us see how uh, this is done uh, uh, in practice uh, and how this is implemented uh, in modern electronic structure uh, codes that uh, implement uh, uh, density functional perturbation theory. Quite generally, we, uh, we write uh, the uh, external potential acting uh, on the electrons, uh, mind, this is not the self-consistent potential. This is just the external potential, the coupling uh, of uh, uh, the uh, electrons uh, of our system uh, to uh, the nuclei and uh, to the uh, external uh, uh, to the external fields. No Hartree and exchange correlation are yet included in uh, V of lambda. Now. The uh, density functional theory says that for each value of lambda, the, uh, uh, the energy as a function of lambda is the minimum with respect uh, uh, to the dynamical variable of our system that now is n, the, uh, 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 the electron density uh, distribution of in a, a, a universal, a universal uh, uh, functional, this is the cone sham, uh, sorry, uh, the Hohenberg and Kohn density functional, that uh, being universal does not depend on lambda. So this is the same for any system, for a molecule, an atom, uh, a glass, uh, uh, a liquid, you name it, you always have the same uh, functional that does not depend on uh, anything but uh, on uh, uh, the uh, strength of the electron electron interaction and on uh, uh, and on uh, uh, the electronic masses plus the uh, coupling with the external potential that instead uh, depends uh, on the external parameter lambda all these uh, of course are constrained to the uh, condition that uh, the uh, electron charge density distribution is normalized to the total number uh, of electrons now we apply we apply uh, hellman feynman that says that uh, the derivative of e of lambda is equal to the derivative of the functional computed at the minimum. But the functional depends on lambda only through V. The F does not depend on lambda. So the F over the lambda is equal to zero. Uh, the, uh, the partial derivative of F with respect to lambda is equal to zero. And so the derivative of the energy with respect to lambda is nothing but the derivative of uh, this object here, this integral here, the, there is an integration volume here that is missing. I should have written dr uh, before closing the parentheses here, sorry. And uh, this derivative uh, is just uh, the integral of uh, the uh, derivative uh, of uh, the potential that is uh, lowercase uh, uh, v with respect to lambda times uh, n of lambda computed at uh, the value of lambda that is the argument uh, uh, of uh, uh, of the energy. Uh, so far for uh, the Hellman Feynman theorem, and uh, the uh, second derivatives are very simply nothing but one further derivative of this. So, in order to compute the second derivative of E with respect to lambda i, lambda j, you have to differentiate with respect to lambda j the derivative with respect to lambda i. But now again, V of i 
does not depend on lambda. So this, this second derivative with respect to lambda j only includes, uh, only acts on uh, uh, n of lambda. So the take home message is that the second derivative of the energy with respect to lambda i, uh, lambda j is equal to the, the, uh, to the integral of vi times the derivative of n with respect to lambda j. But what is the derivative of n with respect to lambda j? It is the linear response of uh, the charge density distribution with respect to uh, the uh, strength of the jth uh, perturbation. Of course, uh, because uh, the, uh, the uh, order of differentiation doesn't matter here in this second derivative, you could have expressed this integral as well as uh, the integral of the product, uh, not of vi n prime j, but as uh, vj here, this index uh, uh, could have been written as j, and this j could have been written as i, uh, because, uh, as, uh, as I was saying a while ago, this uh, second derivative does not depend on uh, the order of differentiation. I will uh, skip uh, this. Uh, the only take home message uh, is that uh, uh, by virtue of the, ex of the very existence of a variational principle, it can be demonstrated that the knowledge of the first order correction to the wave function or to the density in density functional theory gives you access not only to uh, second derivatives uh, of uh, the uh, energy, but also to third derivatives. This is the so-called 2n plus 1 theorem. I don't think uh, that uh, any of uh, uh, the hands-on exercises uh, uh, will uh, uh, will deal with uh, uh, this uh, higher order perturbation theory. So let me just uh, skip uh, this fact. Uh, just uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, linear response theory allows you uh, to compute not only second derivatives of the energies, but also third derivatives. Now, uh, how to compute in practice? Uh, the uh, these uh, second derivatives. We saw that we have to compute the linear response of the density with respect uh, to some external parameter. But uh, because the density is a function of the orbitals, uh, the first derivative of the density can be expressed uh, in terms of the first derivatives of the orbitals. Those are the Kohn-Sham orbitals. And uh, uh, just by expressing these uh, uh, first order corrections uh, in terms of perturbation theory, this is the standard expression of the first order correction to the eigenvalues of uh, Hamiltonian. In this case, the Hamiltonian is the Kohn-Sham Hamiltonian, including, uh, of course, exchange and correlation, because, uh, uh, because exchange and correlation does, uh, uh, does appear in uh, the uh, eigenvalue equation uh, uh, determining that uh, determine uh, the Kohn-Sham uh, Kohn orbitals. So you have to apply the uh, first order per per perturbation theory uh, to the Kohn-Sham orbitals and realize that actually you never want to apply a straight uh, 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 perturbation theory implying a thumb over empty states. This, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, C uh, index uh, indicates uh, conduction states or empty states, empty orbitals. Empty orbitals uh, are never or very, uh, or very seldom computed in uh, modern uh, electronic structure codes. So in order to implement in practice uh, this formula, you had better to find a way of avoiding an explicit uh, computation of empty state. This uh, can be achieved by realizing that uh, uh, this uh, uh, 
perturbed wave function actually uh, is the solution of uh, a inhomogeneous uh, Schrodinger equation. You see that the phi prime uh, satisfies uh, a linear equation whose uh, uh, right, uh, left-hand uh, uh, side is basically the Schrodinger equation. So the Hamiltonian minus uh, the eigenvalue, but the Hamiltonian minus the eigenvalue applied to phi prime is not equal to zero as, as if it were the, uh, the regular uh, eigenvalue equation. Actually, it is equal to the, pro, to the projection over the empty states of the product of the perturbation times the unperturbed wave function. So you may wonder uh, how, what uh, have we gained uh, in this way because uh, we need to compute uh, the uh, projection over the empty states. But the answer is simple because, the, because of uh, completeness of uh, uh, the basis of the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, the sum uh, of uh, the projector over empty and occupy states is equal to one. So I can express the PC, the projector over empty states, as the identity minus the projector over occupy states. But the, the form of the unperturbed occupy states uh, is uh, known upon solution of uh, uh, the Concham equation. So we can solve this uh, linear uh, equation without uh, computing any empty state. So by summarizing, let me sketch a parallel uh, between uh, standard density functional uh, theory and uh, density functional perturbation theory. So density functional theory allows you to establish a correspondence between uh, the external potential acting uh, on, uh, on an electronic system and the uh, uh, electron charge density distribution uh, uh, corresponding to the ground state. This is uh, achieved uh, basically in three steps. We express uh, the density as uh, the sum of the square moduli of, uh, the, uh, uh, of uh, a set of uh, uh, orbitals that are solution of a one-body Schrodinger equation, as uh, you all uh, well know, and uh, this uh, uh, one body Schrodinger equation is uh, uh, completely specified by this uh, uh, self consistent potential that is the sum of the external potential plus Hartree and exchange and correlation. So, starting from uh, the external potential, we can iterate uh, these uh, triplets uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, equations. Uh, until self-consistency is obtained. Uh, density functional perturbation theory is obtained by simply linearizing each of the equations uh, that define density functional theory. So the first equation that expresses uh, the uh, relation between uh, density and uh, effective self-consistent potential is uh, easily uh, linearized. Uh, v prime is simply the external perturbation. Uh, Hartree, the Hartree potential is already a linear functional of, uh, uh, of, the, of the density, and so there is nothing uh, uh, to linearize. And the exchange correlation potential can be linearized uh, explicitly, uh, but uh, this is uh, 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 something that is easily uh, achieved uh, at uh, uh, nearly zero computational cost. So uh, linearizing uh, the expression of the density with respect to Concham orbitals, uh, we obtain the, uh, uh, the expression of uh, uh, the linear uh, density response with respect to uh, perturbed Concham orbitals. And we have seen how these perturbed Concham orbitals satisfy a inhomogeneous uh, uh, Schrodinger equation. That, uh, so this triplet of equations, each one of which uh, is uh, the linearization of uh, uh, each of the three 
defining equations for density functional theory. So these are three linear equations uh, define uh, density functional perturbation theory. So how this is uh, uh, applied uh, to uh, lattice dynamics, that uh, it is going uh, to be the main uh, uh, topic uh, of uh, uh, one of the two main topics uh, of uh, uh, this morning. So basically, suppose you have a regular arrangement uh, of uh, atoms. Here I have sketched uh, uh, a cartoon that would be appropriate uh, for a periodic crystal. But the same considerations would hold for a finite system such as a molecule or for a disordered, uh, a disordered infinite system such as uh, uh, a glass or uh, uh, the instantaneous positions of, uh, of a liquid. So uh, the only uh, key, uh, the only key uh, feature uh, that matters for uh, uh, the derivation that follows is that the blue is not quite the regularity of uh, the arrangement of the blue dots uh, that depict atoms, but the fact that the blue positions are equilibrium positions. So are a, a positions such that uh, no force uh, act, uh, uh, no forces act on uh, any atom. So the forces acting on any atom uh, would vanish. Uh, this, will, uh, this condition of vanishing forces uh, defines, uh, defines the uh, blue position. So I can uh, expand the external potential. V again now is uh, not the self-consistent potential. This is the external potential acting on the electrons. This will be equal to the external potential, the blue external potential computed at equilibrium, plus uh, terms that depend on U, on the atomic displacements that I can uh, tailor expand. And because we are going to do uh, first order perturbation theory, I will stop uh, the uh, Taylor expansion of, uh, uh, of V with respect to U. Uh, we, I will stop, uh, stop it uh, at first order exactly uh, because we are doing first order perturbation theory. <clears throat> so, uh, as a consequence of this uh, uh, expansion, uh, you may uh, expand uh, correspondingly uh, the uh, energy uh, in powers of U in general. The, uh, as, uh, uh, as we saw in one of the first uh, slides of my presentation today, uh, this Taylor expansion will uh, start with uh, linear terms, but we saw that the linear terms are nothing but uh, generalized forces. And we have chosen the blue positions, the, uh, the coordinates uh, of, uh, uh, of the atoms, uh, 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 um, the unperturbed uh, coordinate of the atoms, such as the forces acting on them, vanish because of the condition of equilibrium. So, uh, by expanding around equilibrium, uh, by definition, uh, you you won't have uh, any linear terms here. And the Taylor expansion of the energy uh, uh, in powers of the atomic uh, distortion will start from second order. This Hessian here, this is the second derivative of the energy with respect to the displacements at different positions, R and R prime, are called the interatomic force constant because those are the derivative of the force acting on atom at position R when you displace an atom at position R prime, but because of symmetry, in, uh, uh, in, the in the second derivative, we could as well uh, uh, see this as the derivative of the force ac uh, acting on the uh, atom at R prime with respect uh, to the position of the atom at position R. <clears throat> so, uh, recapitulating, summarizing, density function theory uh, gives you 
uh, a, uh, a way of computing the total energy of the system given the external potential acting on uh, the electrons and the density function perturbation theory uh, 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 gives you a way, an algorithm to compute uh, the second derivatives of the energy uh, once you know the first derivative of the potential. As, uh, as we saw before, uh, actually, this, uh, uh, this Taylor expansion could be uh, pushed to third order without much uh, uh, computational, uh, 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 without extra computational burden because uh, uh, the 2n plus 1 theorem allows you to express the third derivatives uh, in terms of uh, linear response only. But again, uh, we will not be using uh, this property uh, today. And once you have this uh, matrix of second order derivatives, you basically, uh, the eigenvalues of this matrix uh, is basically uh, the square of the vibrational frequencies. Uh, this is squared, so this means that because uh, energies uh, are uh, real, this is positive, these eigenvalues are positive, reflecting the fact uh, that uh, the interatomic force constants, uh, 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 the matrix of the interatomic force constants uh, is positive definite. When it is not, actually this means uh, that you have uh, mistaken a saddle point uh, uh, for a minimum. So if uh, your equilibrium position is a bona fide minimum, then uh, by definition of the minimum, the Hessian has to be uh, positive definite, and uh, all the square frequencies uh, are uh, real and, and positive, are, uh, are positive. If you find any of those eigenvalues to be negative, this means uh, uh, that uh, the uh, equilibrium position uh, that uh, you have assumed to be uh, uh, to be a minimum actually is not a minimum, and uh, the system is mechanically unstable. So let me go very fast uh, on this uh, um, these technical details uh, that are uh, um, important both conceptually and in practice. But uh, I will. Uh, uh, try to convey to you just uh, the take-home message uh, without uh, uh, much hope uh, to be able uh, to explain uh, uh, the details of what I'm gonna I, I, I'm gonna uh, say. So the the, the take-home message is that <clears throat> if you have a, a, a perturbation that breaks the translational symmetry. In general, you could expect uh, that in order to simulate the perturbed system, uh, you have to use uh, uh, supersets. That is something that is possible, uh, you may want uh, to avoid. Actually, symmetry comes uh, uh, to the rescue, and uh, uh, you can compute the complete <coughs> phonon dispersion uh, of periodic systems uh, without using supercells, just uh, using uh, the uh, elementary uh, cell of the unperturbed system. Let us see how this uh, uh, works in practice. So you if you have uh, a perturbation of wave number Q, in general, you have a supercell uh, whose length, uh, whose dimension uh, is uh, the phonon wavelength, so it is the 2 pi over Q. But uh, the uh, perturbing potential has the periodicity of Q. So when uh, you let uh, the perturbing potential that has the periodicity of Q acting on an unperturbed wave function that has uh, a periodicity of K, this K is uh, the wave number, the block wave number, of uh, the unperturbed uh, Hamiltonian. So the right-hand side of, uh, uh, of uh, our uh, uh, inhomogeneous uh, uh, Schrodinger equation is uh, the product of uh, a, a function that has a wave vector Q times a function that has wave vector K. The product has wave vector K plus Q. And so you can extract uh, the uh, phase factors 
from this equation and solve this equation on uh, the elementary cell of the unperturbed system uh, only. So just by factorizing the uh, phase factor of these uh, uh, block states that have uh, well-defined wave vector. A little algebra uh, shows you that uh, all of the three equations of the state functional perturbation theory uh, can be factorized into equations with a well-defined uh, wave number so that you can solve all of them on the uh, elementary cell of, uh, of the unperturbed system. Uh, complications arise when uh, uh, in polar materials, and uh, again, here I don't have the time to go into the details, but you have uh, to keep in mind the one, uh, one key physical concept is that when you have a polar material such as, um, I don't know, um, sodium chloride, kitchen salt, or uh, any binary um, elementary semiconductor such as gallium arsenide or aluminum arsenide or name it, in general, all, uh, all the, uh, all the uh, uh, crystals uh, that uh, have uh, uh, a symmetry lower that, uh, uh, than, uh, uh, than cubic symmetry are such that when you displace uh, one atom from uh, off equilibrium, uh, uh, you uh, generate an overall uh, uh, dipole moment in the system, which means that when you uh, displace uh, two atoms, you will give rise uh, to dipole-dipole uh, interactions that are long range. Because of the long range of uh, the dipole-dipole interaction, the dynamical matrix, uh, that is uh, the Fourier transform of uh, the interatomic force constants, uh, is uh, non-analytic. And uh, as, a consequent of, uh, as a consequence of this uh, non-analyticity, the frequencies of your system at zone center will depend, uh, will be ill-defined at uh, exactly zone center at uh, Q equal to zero. And uh, in the large uh, wavelength limiter, that is in the small uh, wave number, uh, wave vector limit, these uh, uh, limits uh, uh, will uh, depend uh, on uh, the relative orientation of uh, the dipole of the system uh, and uh, the wave vector itself. When uh, the uh, wave vector, when the polarization is parallel uh, to the wave vector, the frequency, the corresponding limiting frequency, is equal to the limiting frequency when uh, uh, the uh, polarization is perpendicular to the wave vector plus a constant that depends on uh, uh, ionic effective charges. Here uh, you have a missing two. Here this Z star that are uh, the ionic uh, effective charges uh, are, uh, uh, are squared. There is a missing square uh, here because uh, effective charges can be positive or negative, but uh, the longitudinal frequency is always larger uh, than, uh, than, uh, the, uh, uh, than the transverse uh, frequency. So in order to compute uh, uh, effective charges, you have to take uh, into account uh, the uh, macroscopic electric field that is uh, generated by a uniform uh, displacement of uh, all the atoms when uh, the uh, displacement is uh, perpendicular, is uh, parallel to the uh, wave vector. And uh, this uh, um, brings about uh, some uh, uh, technical difficulties that uh, uh, whose solution uh, I will uh, skip now. But uh, the take home message uh, is that uh, in order to compute uh, these effective charges that are needed to compute uh, the long wavelength limit uh, of uh, your uh, phonon dispersions, you have to compute uh, separately uh, 
uh, the response to a macroscopic electric field that uh, quantum espresso is, uh, able, is able to do. So basically, uh, when, uh, when uh, you uh, draw uh, a phonon dispersion, so, uh, a phonon dispersion, what you do is uh, compute the phonon frequency at uh, a uh, on a regular grid of uh, wave vectors uh, in uh, in the brilliant zone because uh, uh, because uh, of this uh, 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 long range dipole dipole uh, uh, interactions uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, dynamical matrices are singular in the long wavelength limit and so are difficult to interpolate. In order to interpolate them, what you do, what quantum espresso does, is to subtract the non-analytic part of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the dynamical matrix that comes from the dipole-dipole interactions that can be computed analytically from the effective charges uh, computed from this uh, electric field uh, simulation. Then uh, uh, by subtracting from the dynamical matrix that is computed, those the singular terms, we remain with this uh, uh, regularized uh, blue uh, dynamical matrix that can be easily interpolated uh, in the brilliant zone and after interpolation, you can easily uh, add these uh, analytical, uh, uh, these uh, non-analytical uh, contributions, so, so that uh, the computation of uh, the dynamical matrix at a few select uh, regular, uh, regularly spaced Q vectors give you access to all the. Uh, uh, phonon dispersions uh, over uh, over all uh, the brilliant zone. So summarizing, uh, density functional theory allows you to uh, compute response functions uh, uh, in terms of uh, response orbitals. In order to compute these response orbitals, you have to solve uh, uh, a linear system that is uh, very whose form is very close. Uh, to the standard Consham Schrodinger equation without computing any empty uh, conduction states. You can compute uh, the uh, response of uh, the system to, uh, uh, to just the perturbations you are interested in instead of being forced to compute general uh, polarizabilities, general susceptibilities. And you can apply all this uh, machinery to uh, uh, non-local perturbations, uh, such as uh, uh, those associated to the displacement uh, of uh, atoms. Non-periodic perturbations can be treated uh, with this trick uh, of uh, mapping the perturbation onto the unperturbed uh, unit cell and you can uh, easily compute uh, the response to macroscopic electric fields. So uh, early applications uh, date back uh, uh, to the uh, late uh, 80s. This is uh, the first computation of uh, effective charges uh, and, uh, uh, and the electric constants uh, and the piezoelectric constants in, uh, uh, in a semiconductor back uh, in uh, 1989, very long ago. Uh, the, uh, the formalism uh, soon after was uh, generalized uh, to the computation of uh, phonon dispersions over the entire brilliant zone extended to uh, metals. I, I didn't say anything about the difficulties, the technical difficulties uh, of sampling uh, the Fermi surface. In, uh, uh, in a metal, these difficulties were solved uh, by Stefano De Gironcoli in the mid 90s, and uh, his algorithm is now implemented uh, in uh, Quantum Express. So, lots of uh, applications uh, have been done ever since uh, to the electric constants, uh, to uh, thermal properties, uh, superconductivity, and harmonic uh, 
uh, couplings and the vibration align with uh, um, electron phonon coupling uh, and uh, you name it. Uh, nowadays, uh, you can deal uh, with uh, systems uh, of uh, uh, several dozens of, uh, of atoms up to a few hundred uh, uh, independent atoms, uh, and you can compute uh, very accurately vibrational uh, fr uh, frequencies at surfaces that can be used, uh, for instance, uh, for surface characterization. You can compute uh, vibrational and thermodynamical properties at extreme uh, conditions, uh, such as those uh, uh, <coughs> existing in the interior of planets, and uh, that uh, could hardly be, be measured uh, in the laboratory, so that uh, uh, computer simulation uh, is uh, the main source of information for uh, matter at those extreme uh, conditions. You can uh, do superconductivity and uh, many other applications. So nowadays, uh, uh, roughly 600 uh, papers uh, in uh, uh, per year um, use uh, have been realized uh, uh, thanks to uh, density function perturbation theory. So this, uh, has, uh, as you know, uh, all this is implemented uh, in the quantum espresso package uh, of computer codes, which is maintained and distributed by the Quantum Espresso Foundation with the help uh, and the support uh, of the Max Center, <coughs> European Center of Excellence for Supercomputing Applications. I'm done, and uh, I apologize for the delay and uh, for uh, uh, and for going slightly uh, beyond uh, my time limits. Thanks to all. Okay, yes, so good morning to everyone. My name is Yuri Timrov from EPFL in Switzerland. And uh, the, my, talk, my talk will be about introduction to time-dependent density functional perturbation theory. So now let us uh, consider this band structure. And as we know, density functional theory is the theory for the ground state. Uh, while if we want to describe excitations, we need to go beyond DFT. And this will be the, uh, the topic of this discussion. So if we want to describe excitations from uh, valence or if you want occupied bands to uh, conduction or unoccupied bands, so we need to go beyond DFT, as I said. And imagine, let's imagine that we uh, irradiate our sample with uh, light, so we have incoming photons. So valence electrons absorb these photons and make vertical transitions to uh, conduction bands. So, and we want to describe this kind of uh, processes. So we want to talk about spectroscopies. This is the outline of my talk. I will first uh, show you some basics of TDDFT, uh, more precisely the two Runge-Gross theorems. Then I will uh, discuss about practical methods, how to solve TDDFT equations, in particular, I will mention about Dyson method, Steinheimer, and Dewey Langsus methods. And finally, at the end of my talk, I will uh, discuss about two spectroscopies, which is uh, electron energy loss and inelastic neutron scattering. Okay, so this is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So now uh, we have the time variable in our equation, not only uh, positions of electrons, but also time, because we have system involved in time. And so we need to solve the time-depending Schrodinger equation, where on the left we have the partial derivative of the uh, electronic wave function and uh, with respect to time. And on the right, we have the action of the total Hamiltonian of the system on the wave function. And on the second line, I showed you the expression for the Hamiltonian. As usual, we have the kinetic term, the electron-electron interaction, and the external potential, which now not only depends on special coordinates, but also on time variable. And similarly to static DFT, uh, we don't want to deal with uh, many particle uh, wave function. Instead, we want to work with another object with the charge density. So we go from the 3n plus 1 variables to only four variables. So n of R and T is the charge density. And it's defined as the integral of the square modulus of the our wave function over all degrees of freedom except 1, which is R. But uh, I'm asking uh, myself a question. Can we use the same approach as in DFT? 
And the answer is no, because uh, in DFT, we have a one-to-one -one mapping between static charge density and static external potential. So we use the minimization principle of the total energy. However, we cannot do the same trick in time-dependent DFT. Uh, this straightforward extension simply doesn't work because the total energy is no longer a conserved quantity. So we need, need to do something else. And so this something else was actually uh, proposed by Rung and Gross. Uh, they uh, propose two, two theorems. The first one says that for any system of interacting particles in external time-dependent potential, which can be expanded in Taylor series with respect to time, and given an initial state, psi zero of R, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the external time-dependent potential and the time-dependent density N of R and T, apart from a trivial function of time. So there is a one-to-one -one mapping between external potential and density, which are both time-dependent. But now we need the second theorem that says that we define the quantum mechanical action functional A, which is given by this uh, expression, which is the uh, integral of the expectation value of the operator, which is A i h bar d over dt minus the Hamiltonian. And so this quantum mechanical action functional becomes stationary at the exact time-dependent density, which we call n0 of rt, and which corresponds to the external potential v external of rt, and given the initial state psi zero at time t0. So this means that the, uh, the, the functional derivative of a with respect to n at n0 is equals to zero. But this doesn't mean that this must be a minimum of this uh, action function. It can be also a maximum. So the theorem states simply that it should be a stationary, stationary point. Uh, so, but in practice, uh, so we, what we do, we actually represent our action functional as the sum of several terms, uh, the, the, the kinetic term, the heart rate term, exchange correlation term, and the last one is the integral of the external time-dependent potential and the time-dependent charge density. The heart rate uh, action functional term is given by this usual expression, uh, integrals of the two uh, the, the product of the two charge densities divided by the, the uh, distance between particle R and R prime, the, the standard expression. Uh, but we, as, as in DFT, we don't know the expression for the exchange correlation uh, action functional. So we need to use approximations. So we have the same problem as in DFT, but even more complicated because now we have also the time dependence. In practice, we saw the time dependent Kunshem equation written here. Uh, so on the left, we have the, the partial derivative of the wave function with respect to time. And on the right, we have this uh, operator acting on the wave function. And this operator has the kinetic term and the so-called effective time-dependent constant potential, the expression for which is shown below. Uh, we have the Hartree part, exchange correlation part, and external potential. And finally, the charge density which depends on time, is simply the sum of the square modulus of the uh, Konchem wave function phi of i. So it's very similar to DFT, but now we have extra complexity due to uh, dependence on time. And just before I continue, in practice, uh, we always use the so-called adiabatic approximation for the exchange correlation part. Okay, this was a very quick uh, introduction to the basics of uh, TDFT. But now let's go to more uh, practical side. How do we solve these equations in practice? So there are three popular methods, Dyson, Steinheimer, and Levin Langsus. So let's go very quickly through all of them just to have a, uh, an, a quick overview. Okay, let me uh, now talk about the linear response TDDFT, or we call it TDDFPT. So let us assume that the time-dependent external potential is weak. This allows us to represent the time-dependent external potential as sum of two terms. The first one is the static one, uh, V external zero, which does not depend on time, plus the, the second term, which is the, the small perturbation. So we call, we call it V prime external. But this uh, perturbation is actually time dependent. By doing so, we can also expand in Taylor series 
other quantities such as the time dependent charge density so as you can see we expand it to zero order term first order term second order term etc but as just professor baroni showed you we uh, often uh, stop at the first order term so we neglect the second order and higher order terms so that's why it's called linear response or first order perturbation theory and th this means that we can uh, actually establish a relationship between this uh, first order uh, response charge density and prime and the uh, external uh, potential v prime external it depends on time and the connection between these two quantities is via the so-called uh, response function chi which depends on uh, electronic positions r and r prime but also time but actually t minus t prime and this is really the the main quantity of interest this susceptibility function Yeah, this is what I say. Uh, there are three popular methods to how to solve TDDFPT equations, and we now discuss. We'll discuss uh, all of them quickly. So the oldest and uh, so-called conventional method is the Dyson equation. Uh, it's given by this quite complicated e equation. If you are not familiar with it, so we have here uh, different objects. One of them is uh, chi matrix which depends on reciprocal lattice vectors gg prime frequency omega and the uh, uh, vector q so stefano baroni introduced this uh, in in the last lecture he introduced dfpt and you, you saw already this vector q which is the uh, monochromatic perturbation or the wave vector of the perturbation so we have this object chi on the left but at the same time it also appears on the right so the unknown actually is appears on two sides of the equation then there is another object chi naught which is uh, the so-called independent particle uh, polarizability so it's defined uh, with this equation it's a sum over k points over the whole brilliant zone uh, it's there is a sum over n and prime which are uh, occupied in empty states then there are uh, fermi direct distribution function f it, points k and k plus q divided by h bar omega which is the energy of the incoming photon epsilon and k and epsilon and prime k plus q are the concham eigenvalues or energies and plus imaginary uh, const, uh imaginary number times uh, eta where eta is some smearing fun uh, smearing uh, parameter and then we have two matrix elements uh uh, so basically to compute chi naught all we need to know is simply concham energies and concham wave functions so we just need uh, dft quantities but then we plug in this object chi naught in the dyson equation and we need to solve it in this equation we also have the uh, Fourier transform of the Coulomb potential v of g1 of q and we have uh, the so-called exchange correlation kernel f exchange correlation which we need to approximate using uh, typically adiabatic approximation so this uh, equation is implemented in many codes uh, in particular in yambo code that will be the topic of tomorrow's discussion so it's it's really uh, uh, the conventional approach uh, however there are a couple of uh, weak points in this method the first one is that we have some of our numerous empty states and prime in this uh, summation on the top in the correlation of chi naught because in principle we have infinite number of empty states but in practice of course we cannot work with infinite numbers so in practice we need to truncate the sum over empty states and one has to perform convergence tests so that is quite expensive uh, second uh, weak point is that we have multiplication and inversion of large matrices so these are large matrices and but there are some tricks implemented in different code to speed up this these uh, linear algebra operations and finally these matrices chi naught and chi must be computed for every value of frequency so in practice we have these frequencies omega and we have discrete grid so for every value of frequency we need to solve this equation so it's quite um, expensive the whole procedure but it's really straightforward and it works extremely well so you can use it in in yambo but tomorrow you will not uh, play with tddft in yambo but you will learn about gw 
Uh, that was the first method. The second method, uh, which is actually, I think, a bit less popular than the Dyson equation, is uh, called the Steinheimer method. So it works the following way. We write down the time-dependent Consham equations. So the, the, the derivative of the wave function with respect to time, which is equals to the action of the Hamiltonian on the wave function. So the definition of the Hamiltonian is given by this expression. As I said, there is kinetic term, external potential that depends on time, and the heart in exchange correlation potential that also depends on time. Uh, now, if we is, we said we can write the external potential in yellow as the sum of two terms, one the static and second weak time-dependent perturbation. And we also saw that we can write the charge density also as the, the ground state charge density and zero that does not depend on time, plus the response time-dependent component. And finally, the, the uh, heart exchange correlation time-dependent potential also can be written as the sum of two terms. One is the ground state DFT uh, static potential plus the, the, the small uh, response that depends on time. So therefore, we can write the quantum Hamiltonian as uh, the, the two parts, the, the ground state Hamiltonian H0 plus weak, uh, uh, weak time-dependent part V prime. And this is simply by uh, combining together the quantities defined on the previous slide. Uh, next, we can write the wave function phi, is, uh, which is the time-dependent quantity, as the exponential, which is this, uh, this phase factor, plus so times the two components. One is the static one, as usual, and plus uh, the response time-dependent part of the wave function. And uh, after all, uh, this being said, we can put things together and write down these two uh, basic equations. So the first one is called the resonant equation and second anti-resonant. So this is uh, really the key uh, equations. They must be solved uh, together. I will show on the next slide, I think, if I'm not wrong. So we need to solve them simultaneously together, self-consistently. On the left, we have time derivatives. On the right, we have uh, various components, as you can see here. So yes, so on this slide, I show you why they need to be solved together. So if we write down in green uh, the response heart and exchange correlation potential, uh, sorry, I forgot to say that now we made the Fourier transform from time domain to frequency domain. So now we write this uh, term in green, which is the integral of the uh, response frequency dependent charge density multiplied by Coulomb and exchange correlation kernels. So we need to know response charge density and prime. And that object in magenta is written uh, here, which depends on the uh, time independent orbitals, phi naught of R here and here. But at the same time, it depends on phi prime of omega and phi prime complex conjugated of minus omega. But this is actually unknowns in yellow. I highlight the unknown in yellow. So actually, we are ending up in the loop where we have uh, dependencies. But after all, it's a closed loop of equations. So this has to be solved self-consistently uh, via iterative, uh, by using some iterative algorithms. In this equation, also, you can uh, notice the object in blue which is the projector on empty states. So Professor Baroni already explained it in the previous lecture. So I don't want to spend time on this. And so what about this method? So the strong, the strengths of this method is that there are no, uh, there is no need in empty states, thanks to the projector uh, PC. That is really a very big advantage. However, there is still a weakness in this method. Uh, more precisely that the Steinheimer equations must be solved for every value of frequency. That's the same as in Dyson equation. So still, computation, it's not, uh, not so light, I would say. And finally, I would like to describe quickly the third method, which is the louisville langsos method, which is implemented in quantum espresso. This Langsos method is really very popular uh, iterative algorithm. It's used in many, to solve many problems. It's also used in, in the Yambo code, but also many other codes. 
It's very powerful uh, algorithm. So what is the basis of this Liouville Langstroth method? So instead of solving um, two coupled equations of, Steinheim, of the Steinheimer method, we're actually uh, rewriting the problem in terms of the so-called quantum Liouville equation, which is written here, where we uh, deal with the charge density uh, matrix operator rho of time, but it depends on time. So on the left, we have the, the time derivative of this object. And on the right, we have the commutator of the time dependent Consham Hamiltonian and this uh, density matrix operator. So now we need to solve this equation. Uh, as usual, we want to use uh, perturbation theory to first order, or that is to say linear response. So we first define how the charge density matrix operator looks like. So it's written here simply the sum over uh, states labeled with index V, and it's the product between uh, orbitals phi and phi complex conjugated at R and R prime. So using a linear uh, algebra, it can be shown that uh, when we use the perturbation theory to first order, we can rewrite the quantum level equation at the top as equation at the bottom so now we have the response charge density matrix operator rho prime on the left and on the right we have multiple commutators um, i don't want to go into detail uh, and describe each of them but what i would like to mention is that the, the response charge density matrix operator rho prime is defined using this equation where we have the ground state wave functions phi naught and we have the response wave function phi prime, which are the uh, the quantities uh, that we we also saw in the Steinheimer method. So now, how to solve this equation in practice? So we need to use the Langsos uh, algorithm for that. This is again rewriting these equations in a compact form by defining a new uh, so-called super operator, which is the Liouvillian, this uh, L operator which is the sum of two terms, two commutators. And uh, then, as usual, we go from the time domain to the frequency domain by, perform by using the Fourier transform. So the equation on the top can be actually written as equation at the bottom. So we go from time to frequency domain. On the left, we have H bar omega, the photon energy minus the Liouvillian superoperator. All these operator, operator acting on the response uh, uh, density matrix operator, and this is equal to the commutator of the uh, external potential with the ground state density matrix operator. Formally, we can write the solution of this equation by simply taking the inverse of the operator on the left and put it on, on the right hand side, and that's it. That's the, our solution. And this is really the key because uh, now we can define the response function chi for the quantum mechanical operator A as the trace of the product of this quantum mechanical operator A multiplied by the response density rho prime. And rho prime is actually given by expression just above. So formally, we have the way how to de define the response function using this duville lanxus uh, approach. Sorry, I go a bit fast, but this is indeed the rest of time. So as I said, in practice, we need to solve these equations using the Langsos recursive algorithm. To do that, we need to define so-called standard batch representation, that is uh, this object Q and P, that are defined as half sum and half difference of the response wave functions. By doing so, we can rewrite our linearized Fourier transformed uh, quantum level equation is a matrix equation on the right in this blue rectangle, where on the left we have our matrix acting on these uh, batch orbitals equals this object on the right. It's all it's very quite quite involved math, but what we have here in yellow and magenta are the super operators D and K, uh, given by expressions uh, here below on on this slide. 
So the D operator is quite simple. It's simply the ground state Hamiltonian minus eigenvalues acting on Q, while K is really the interaction superoperator, which contains Hartree and exchange correlation uh, types of interactions. Now uh, we use this uh, algorithm. We define two component Langsus vectors, capital V and capital U, in terms of this uh, Q and P batch objects. We can write down the Langsus recursion chain. So we do many iterations and they are all uh, interlinked. You will hear more about this during the hands-on session by Tommaso and Oscar. They will go a bit in more details about this method and how to use it. But essentially to uh, evolving this Langsus recursion chain, we can generate a so-called three diagonal matrix T, which is the uh, sparse matrix. There are many zero matrix elements except uh, beta coefficients and gamma coefficients that we compute at each iteration. And uh, by knowing this three diagonal matrix, we can compute the final quantity of interest, which is the susceptibility chi, using this mathematical definition. And we have this object in magenta, uh, Xi. These objects are quite complicated to explain, but they are computed on the fly. So that's it about this uh, Langsus algorithm. Sorry to go in too fast, but uh, my colleagues will explain in more detail how does it work in the in the later on during hands-on session. So what about the advantages and disadvantages of this method? The advantages is that there is no need in empty states like in the Steinheimer method. The three diagonal matrix must be computed only once, so we don't need to do this procedure for every value of frequency. And finally, the post-processing is very light, takes just a few seconds. And moreover, we can use the extrapolation technique for Langsus coefficients that allows us to speed up the convergence uh, a lot. Uh, in terms of weaknesses, uh, sometimes one can have some uh, instability of the Langsus chain, uh, in particular uh, for a magnon spectroscopy, but probably my colleagues will mention more about this later during the hands-on session. Okay, that was the quick overview of the methods. And to use the final uh, couple of minutes, I would like to explain how these methods can be used for two spectroscopies, for plasmonics and magnonics. So let me first start with electron energy loss in solids. So our perturbation is the plane wave. So we irradiate our samples with electrons. And we can define the charge density susceptibility chi using this equation, where we have the, the density density response uh, function. So that's the scalar product of a uh, uh, charge density operator. And we can see here frequencies of, uh, of our uh, incoming electrons, but also the Liouvillian super operator. And this has to be inverted. So we need to, to know the resolvent of this. The operator. By computing the uh, charge density susceptibility chi, we can compute the final quantity of interest, which is the inverse dielectric function epsilon to the power of minus one, given by this simple equation. And finally, to establish a link with experiments by taking the imaginary part of this epsilon minus one uh, dielectric function with the minus sign. This is really proportional to the double differential cross section that is measured experimentally. So we can really compute from first principles objects, quantities that are actually directly measured in experiments. And this object uh, is actually called a uh, loss function. It can be obtained using the turbo eels called quantum espresso. Uh, this, uh, the code that implements this method is uh, described in this paper that was published about uh, seven, eight years ago. And let me show you a few examples. How does it work in practice? This is uh, the loss function of bulk diamond. On, on the left, I show you how this loss function is a function of energy uh, converges with respect to the number of Langsus iterations. So we see we go from 1000, where we have very noisy spectrum, uh, down to 5000, which is already 
a smooth function and uh, we can also show here that thanks to the extrapolation techniques we don't need to go to 5000 iterations even 1000 is sufficient uh, given that we extrapolate the Langs coefficients and on the right I show you the convergence of the loss function with respect to the key points so it's also uh, we can see that it is converged around with the grid 14 by 14 by 14 for, for diamond. Uh, does it compare well with experiments? The answer is yes, the comparison is, uh, is fairly good. So this is again diamond on the left. We show here the, the computed spectrum using the lv Langs approach, LL, as well as uh, using the, uh, the method based on the DICE, solution of the Dyson equation. They really uh, in very close agreement. And moreover, they are very close to experimental spectrum. And on the right, I show you how this spectrum evolves as a function of the transfer momentum Q. So we go from 0 0.1 angstrom to the minus 1 to 1 1.7. You see really that there is a evolution of the plasmon peak, which is around uh, 35 uh, electron volt. So this was diamond. You can study other systems like silicon, aluminum, and again, we, we see very good agreement with experiments. And finally, more uh, challenging systems like bulk bismuth, which has strong spin orbit coupling. So we need to, to include the relativistic effects. But again, we see uh, a good agreement with experiments on the left. We reproduce all features that are observed in experiments up to high energies. And also, we can. Uh, investigated the evolution of all these peaks as a function of the transferred momentum and also check the importance of spinner decoupling that if you want to learn more you can check this paper this reference at the bottom so the tdft works well uh, for uh, lecton energy loss spectroscopy in solids using adiabatic approximation so-called alda however this method has limitations in particular we cannot describe excitons within this approximation. So we need to use more advanced exchange correlation kernels, which has to be non-local to have also excitons. And uh, this is the, the, the second example uh, for magnons. So here we talked about an elastic neutron scattering. Now, instead of incoming electron, we have actually uh, irradiation on the sample by neutrons. So we described it mathematically as uh, uh, external magnetic field, B, and sigma are Pauli matrices. So we can define the magnetization density susceptibility chi, again, using this expression, where we have the uh, magnetization density operators, M, and the resolvent of the Liouvillian. Uh, by computing this response uh, function, we can compute the dynamical uh, structure factors S uh, using these objects. And is in the case of uh, electron energy spectroscopy, we have a direct direct link with experiments where uh, experimentalists measure double differential cross sections. Uh, this method for magnonics is described in a paper which was published this summer. So you can uh, read more about this method. But I would like to conclude my talk with a couple of quick examples. One is the chromium triodide, uh, this ferromagnetic two-dimensional uh, system, which gained a lot of interest in the community. So we were curious to investigate, uh, compute magnons from first principle in this system. So using the levy Langsus method, we uh, compute the response matrix, which is actually a three by three matrix. That's why we have three by three uh, um, matrix of spectra on the left the real part on the right imaginary part so on the diagonal we have the diagonal components of this uh, matrix and we also have the off diagonal terms i think tomaso will describe more in more detail uh, these objects during the hands-on session uh, would like to mention that there are two ver versions of the langsus algorithm one is called pseudo remission and the second uh, non-remission so they give exactly the same results, but pseudo remission is two times faster than non remission algorithm. So it is always recommended to use the pseudo remission version. And finally, this is the magnon dispersion. 
for the chromium triodide uh, monolayer with or without spinner decoupling. So you see how the magnon energy evolves is a function of the magnon vector Q. In particular, when Q tends to zero, uh, we have that without spinner decoupling, it goes to zero, almost vanishing. While when you have spin, uh, spin decoupling, you have a non-zero uh, gap at gamma. Uh, another uh, two examples, bulk iron and bulk nickel, we see that in the case of iron, the magnon dispersion is in very good agreement with experiments and other computational methods. While for nickel, we have a factor of two deviation from experiments, uh, also a, as in other works. Uh, this is due to the uh, ALDA approximation that uh, overestimates, um, as I said, overestimates magnon energies. So this is really the drawback of the functional. We need to use more advanced functionals to, to have a better agreement with experiments. Here we used uh, LDA. That's it. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the attention. Uh, I leave it here, summary of my lecture, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So I will be with you for the next uh, like 25 minutes. And my colleague Laura will continue the second part of the phone on hands on. And then in, there will be Tomas and Oscar who will continue with about one hour of the hands on for TDDFT. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank my colleague Laura, who really spent a lot of time and effort to to prepare this presentation, pre prepare material for the hands-on. It's really amazing work. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, with this, I think we can uh, get started with very brief and quick uh, theory recap. So Professor uh, Baroni already explained extremely well uh, the theoretical concepts. Here I would like just to say some, uh, discuss some practicalities. So at the bottom of this slide, we show the, the matrix of interatomic force constants. Its the notations are slightly different from the notations in the Stefano Baroni's lecture, but the key message is that <coughs> sorry, the interatomic force constants uh, is defined simply as the second derivative of the total energy with respect to the atomic displacements. So here, index S small s uh, labels atoms from 1 to n80, which is the number of atoms. Alpha are Cartesian indices, x, y, z. Capital R is the point in the brave, uh, brave lattice in defining the position uh, of a given cell. N of R is the number of unit cells in the crystal. And uh, vectors U with indices S and alpha, uh, they indicate the displacements of the uh, atom labeled with the index S in the direction alpha. Okay, so this is our matrix of interatomic force constants. What's next? Uh, next is actually we uh, compute the dynamical matrix D uh, via this expression. So there is summation over RR prime, interatomic force constants and the phase factors. And once we, we have this dynamical matrix, we solve the secular equation over here. And by uh, diagonalizing this equation, we obtain eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So eigenvalues are the square of the phonon frequencies, omega q. Yeah. Eigenvectors are these uh, u uh, vectors. OK, so. And finally, uh, some quick recap on density functional perturbation theory. So to solve that equation, uh, first we need actually to deal with the Steinheimer equation. Actually, in my DDFT lecture, I described the Steinheimer method, but it was for the frequency extension. Here, uh, I would like to remind that we don't have uh, frequency or time extension, so it's really static. So time equal to zero, no evolution in time, it is static. So this is the Steinheimer equation. Here we have quite many complicated objects. Uh, the first one is the HSCF. So SCF stands for self-consistent field. 
And this operator H depends on the K plus Q, where K is the point in the Brillouin zone and Q is the, the vector of the perturbation. And this is dealt with the routine H psi. So we make a link with the routines of quantum espresso because later Laura will explain a little bit the, the timing uh, for different routines when using CPU and GPU. So, okay, we have this Hamiltonian, then we have some regularization operator, alpha P, I don't want to spend time on it. Uh, then we have eigenvalues, epsilon K, the objects of interest, delta Psi of K plus Q. This is the quantities that we want to obtain by solving this equation. And on the right-hand side, we have the projector on empty states. So that is implemented in the routine orthogonalize because what we are doing, we're actually projecting on the empty states manifold by orthogonalization procedure. We have the response potential delta V SCF of Q and the ground state wave function Psi. So the action, the multiplication of this uh, potential delta V with Psi is actually dealt with by the routine apply D pot, apply uh, response potential. So in this equation, we have the uh, operator delta V and the definition of this operator is shown on the, at the bottom left. We have the bare potential, Hartree potential and exchange correlation potential. And as we can notice in the Hartree part, we have the response of the charge density, delta NQ, which is given by this expression that you, you saw during Professor Baroni's lecture. And this object, the response charge density is implemented in this routine with this uh, quite obscure name, which I can't even pronounce. All right. Uh, so why do we need to solve this equation? When we solve it, we obtain this object delta psi from this by knowing this object we can compute the matrix of interatomic force constants via some complicated equation that i won't don't want to show not to distract you too much but you can find those equations in these two references and by uh simply doing the fourier transform we obtain the dynamical matrix and we solve the secular equation we obtain phonon frequencies so that's the procedure and that's how it's implemented that's all for the theory. Quick uh, reminder. Uh, yeah, this is slide just summarizing what can be done with the phonon code of quantum espresso. You can deal with insulators, metals, non-magnetic, magnetic systems. You can include spinner decoupling. You can have electric field calculations to compute Born effective charges in the electric tensor. Uh, this is what ex was explained by Professor Baroni for polar materials. In uh, for the recent developments, we would like to mention phonons for magnetic systems in the fully relativistic non-collinear framework, as well as phonons with the D within the DFT plus U approach, where we have Hubbard corrections for transition metal compounds. And now let's get started with the hands-on. Uh, I mean, to start running some calculations, this is the system that we will use. A famous perovskite that is a candidate for uh, solar cells. It has five, five atoms in the primitive cell. And uh, so how many phonon moles do we have? We have three multiplied by the number of atoms, which is five. So we have 15 phonon moles in total. Okay, so when you download the material, um, you will find in day two, bunch of files so let's do it okay so if you connect to vega you have this repository with the material so i would like to ask you just to uh, do git pull in order to get the latest uh, changes in the repository because yesterday evening we did some last minute updates so just do git pull git pull and you obtain the update i already did it so nothing happens but please do it on your account on the Baker cluster. Then you just go to day two. And here we have the PDF file hands-on day two. This is the presentation that I'm sharing now. And we need to go to exercise underscore pH for the phonon part. If you go to inputs, here we have different input files. 
and this is the, this is what is described on this slide. I don't want to go to spend too much time because we don't have don't have it. So first, we need to perform the PWSCF simulation using the PW.x code. So in this example, we will perform um, VC relax calculation using the PW.x code to obtain the ground state. So the ground state density, the ground state of a function psi. And so let's do it. So this is the input file for the VC relax calculation. You're already familiar with the input file for w.x code. Uh, you need to do a number of steps. They are described in the readme file, but also summarized on this slide. You need to copy the input file pw. Dot, this name of the material dot input in the current folder. So the step one. And in the in the control name list, you need to add VC relax as the type of the calculation that we perform. Then you need to open a submit slurm uh, script and modify uh, NPW to the number of MPI process uh, that we are going to use, which is four. Then you submit the calculation and you copy the output directory out in the folder for the next step, step two. So let's take a few minutes to, to accomplish this uh, part. If you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask, or uh, you can use Hack and B. Also, I do it here in parallel. So here we copy the input file to step one. Then we open the input file and we need to we need, we need to specify here the calculation we see relax. All the rest is already fine. We save it. Then we need to open the the submit dot slurm script. Yesterday you already learned the, what is the meaning of each line on the script. Now we will use four GPUs. So we'll use one node and four GPUs. Then you can see also number of number of tasks per node is four, number of tasks per socket two, and CPUs per task 32. And here we have MPI run with a number of uh, options. And here, instead of NPW, we specify four. And we save it. And we can submit the calculation. Okay, all is good. Now we can check the queue. Okay, it's running. And with the command tail minus F and the name of the output file, we can observe the execution in real time of the calculation. So you see the code performs the ground state uh, DFT calculation using uh, iterative algorithm. Since this is VC relax, the code also moves atoms in order to minimize forces and stresses acting on atoms. So please try to run the same calculation. The number of resources is uh, limited, so maybe your calculation will not enter immediately. So we need to wait a little bit in the queue. You can also play with the reservation, max GPU. So if you wait too long, maybe you just remove the reservation. So maybe your job will enter faster. So it should take uh, I think a couple of minutes, if I'm not wrong. But please ask questions if you have any.
Okay, while waiting for the calculation, maybe, okay, it's actually finished. Okay. So it's standard VC relax calculation, nothing uh, particularly new. So once this is done, we can proceed to the uh, second step, which is the phonon calculation. So we'll run uh, the calculation using the ph.x program. So what the code does, it will actually compute. So it will perform a non-self-consistent field calculation to determine also the wave function psi at points k plus q. In this case, uh, we're running calculation at gamma. So the q point is equal to zero. So actually, in this case, there is uh, nothing to do. But if you run the following calculation at the q point, which is different from zero, then the code will need to perform NSCF calculation to determine psi at k plus q. And then it will uh, solve the secular equation, diagonalize the dynamical matrix, and output the phonon frequencies. This is the, so we need to go to step two. We need to copy the input file for the phonon calculation from inputs to folder step two. And we need to do a couple of modifications in the input file. In particular, we need to add the coordinates of the gamma points. So after the slash, we need to put 0, 0, 0. This is the coordinates of the Q point. In the Cartesian coordinates, in units of 2 pi over a, where a is the lattice parameter. Also, we need to specify uh, masses of atoms, 1, 2, and 3, as shown here. If you don't specify masses, the code, it, the code will still work but it will do, take the values which were specified in the PWSCF input. So you see in PWSCF, we already have atomic species and masses, so they must be correct. Because if you don't specify them here, the code will look in that input file. But if you specify them here, this has the higher priority, so it will read from here. And we need to put prefix PWSCF, this is the default, so let's, and then we submit the, the calculation using uh, one GPU. Okay, so let's do that. So just one comment, this was the VC Relax. So what happened is that we actually have new atomic positions and new cell parameters. So in principle, we should take these new ones and re redo the SCF calculation using the new geometry. But we skip this step in the interest of time. We simply, will perform the phonon calculation on top of this uh, VC relaxed one. Okay, so what we need to do is to, to copy the output directory from step one to step two. Okay, so we do that because the phonon code will read information from this uh, output directory that contains different temporary files, such as wave functions, charge density, information about the lattice, and many other pieces of information. So that we need for step two. Uh, then we can go to step two folder, and we need to copy the input file from inputs, the h dot in here. That's good. And then we need to modify a couple of things in this input. So we need to put masses here and we need to specify prefix WSCF and the coordinates of the Q point at which we perform the phonon calculation. This, in this case, it's just simply zero. Okay, and for the masses, uh, okay, we need to, okay, so let's say I'm lazy, I don't want to do that. So I simply remove it. And what will happen, the code will read the masses from the input file. Actually, this information is stored already in the output directory here. So you see there is XML file with different information and should contain information about masses. So I, re I rely on that, but you can also specify it in the input. Then in the submit script, everything is okay. So we will use one node, one GPU. 
So all the rest is already in place. So we are ready to submit the calculation. This batch submit slurm. Takes uh, some time. Please try to do these steps on your own. And if you have any problems, please uh, tell us. Okay, it's running. And again, we can uh, see in real time the execution of the code by typing tile, tail minus F the name of the output file. So now, okay, it's doing the calculations. Yeah. So while waiting, it will take, I think, five minutes. So it's it let it run. But what I will do, I will go to reference folder, which already contains the, the solution. So let's inspect quickly the output file of the phone code. So we go here. So we see that the system has 49 symmetry operations. Uh, we have 20 key points listed here. So keep this information uh, in mind because this will be important for the discussion later on when we will use the parallelization over pools. So we will parallelize the following correlation over key points. So remember that we have 20 key points. And here we have uh, information about irreducible representations. So we have five atoms. The code will displace those atoms and it finds five irreducible representations. So they are listed here. And each of these representation has three modes. So you can see here, the code takes representation one, modes one to three and it performs iterative solution of the Steinheimer equation using the conjugate gradient algorithm. Then convergence has been reached. Then it goes to representation two that contains modes four, five, six, and also perform the convergence calculation and so on. Then the representation three, four, and five. And then for the Q point zero, 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 which is gamma, it reports the phonon frequencies. There are 15 of them, three times the number of atoms, which three times five equals 15. The first three are uh, so-called acoustic modes and all the remainder, remaining ones are optical modes. So we have 12 optical modes and three acoustic modes. So this is really what we are, uh, interested in. This is our final property of interest frequencies. And at the end of the output calculation, you also see, sorry, at the end of the output file, you see the report, how much time the phonon code took, including all detailed information from different routines. And you can see the name of the routine and they are reported on my uh, initial slides. But Laura will discuss in more detail the timing uh, using GPUs with different types of parallelization like pools and images, but more will follow in a few minutes. Okay, so this is the output. The calculation probably is still running. Let me check. No, it's finished. I hope you also managed to run it. So this is the output file that I already analyzed a little bit, the frequencies and also the uh, eigenvectors, the phonon displacements. So number of K points we discussed, number of reducible representations we discussed, but also, yeah, this information about phonon frequencies is reported not only in the output file, but also in another file called uh, harmonic dynamical matrix support. So this is, let's check, have it? Yes, it's this file. Here it is. A second. Only. Yeah, it's empty for some reason. 
Strangely, mm. should not be empty. I don't know what's happening, but should be contain some information. Maybe I did something wrong. No reporting error. Maybe I did something wrong. I don't know what exactly. Okay. We'll try to figure out later. But if you want, you can go to reference folder. And here is this file. So it should be like this, actually. So you see frequencies and corresponding following displacements. We have five rows because we have five atoms. And then we have real and imaginary parts. So X, Y, Z. Okay, that was step two. Uh, but the problem here is that for the first three phonon modes, we need to have actually exactly zero frequencies. I mean, in theory, it should be exactly zero, which are acoustic modes. I mean, because it's simply a, yeah. a translation of the whole lattice. Okay, so the acoustic modes, we need exactly zero, but we have some deviation from zero. And this is because uh, we violate the acoustic sum rule because of the numerical inaccuracies. So, Yuri, your job is apparently not finished. Maybe that's why the file is empty. Oh, okay. Coming oh, from the chat. Thanks, thanks. Oh, yes, exactly. I see, I see. Thank you so much, Tom. Now we have non-zero content of this folder, or this file. Oh, okay. I am relieved. Thanks. It's good. Yes, for the acoustic sum rule, we violate it because we use uh, GGA approximation, generalized gradient approximation. We use a finite cutoff. We use finite key points. All these technicalities, this leads to some violation of the acoustic summary. So we can impose it, this rule, using the program dinmat.x. This will really apply this, uh, this definition and will really enforce it to be zero. So we need to do the final step from my side, step three. Uh, using the math.x program, but we need to do a number of steps. First, we need to copy the input file for this program and modify it a little bit by specifying the type of the acoustic sum rule, which is crystal. There are different types of acoustic sum rules. It can be simple, it can be crystal. There are some other uh, options you can see in the documentation. Then we need to copy this file with the uh, with the frequencies. Uh, harmonical uh, dynamical matrix support in the current folder because dinmat.x program will read information from this file. And simply we submit the calculation and check the new corrected phonon modes frequencies. So let's do these steps. So we go, so first we copy this file to step three. Okay. Then we go to step three and we copy the input file from inputs or uh, let's see what we have. Okay, it's din dot chemical formula of the material. We copy here. We open the input file and we need to say the type of the acoustic sample, which is crystal. We save it. And let's have a look at the submission script. We were not asked to do anything, so we still use one GPU of one node. And that's it. And we use the modded X program. So note that we don't use pools, image parallelization, nothing for the moment, but it will be really in the next steps. Okay, let's run this calculation as batch and the name of the script, submit, let's learn. Again, it takes a few seconds. This calculation is very fast. It takes really a few seconds. The most expensive is the phone calculation. It's much more expensive than the ground state DFT calculation. 
and this uh, application of the acoustic sum rule is really fast. The submission takes more time than the calculation itself in this case. Okay, let's wait a little bit more. But while waiting, uh, okay, no, I can't do that. Let me just go to the reference folder. Uh, once the calculation is done, let's have this. Let's have a look at this output file. You can really see that it takes a fraction of a second. But this is the output file. And what we have is this one, is then our new updated frequencies. But now you see that the first three modes, which are acoustic, are exactly zero because we really impose the acoustic sum rule exactly. And then we have the 12 remaining optical modes. And that's it. So that's all for this phonon calculation of gamma. I stop here and uh, I give the floor to my colleague, Laura, who will continue to explain to you different levels of parallelization of the phone code. Laura, please. By now you saw how to um, use the phone on code, in particular for a, a run on a single GPU. Uh, in the next two exercises, I'd like to show you how to run uh, the phone code on multiple GPUs, in particular by exploiting the parallelization levels that are uh, available in uh, Quantum Espresso. So, um, first of all, let me highlight the fact that uh, uh, the uh, GPU enabled version of the phone is a new feature. Uh, of Quantum Espresso, which is uh, available from uh, the Devil branch uh, that we are uh, running today. And um, in, basically, most of the phonon uh, code is uh, ported uh, on the GPU, in particular for the, um, uh, let's say, for the calling path involving uh, non conserving pseudo potentials. And the philosophy that has been used to do the offload is based on. Uh, uh, OpenACC and CUDA Fortran, like for the other uh, software codes in the Quantum Espresso suite. Uh, for example, um, here you can see the basic structure uh, of the routines invoked during the uh, calculation of the phonon frequencies at a given Q point. Uh, we have some uh, uh, routines which are peculiar of the phonon code that have been unfloated, some routines that are in common with PW, and some other routines from the linear module, uh, linear module that are in common with the time dependent TD DFPT, uh, which is uh, uh, GPU enabled as well. But uh, in order to uh, show you um, better how the, the, the amount of the code that has been actually uh, offloaded to GPUs, I'd like to show you a trace of the application with NVIDIA size system. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the concept of uh, tracing an application and um, side system tracing tools. So please raise your hand if uh, you have some uh, uh, knowledge about that. Okay, well, I will spend a few words on that just to explain the concept. So first of all, a tracing tool uh, is a tool which is able to capture uh, the uh, invocation to routines from your code or from an external library, for example, CUDA library or OpenACC directives. It records the duration of these routines, uh, the number of occurrence, it stores this information on a report, and then uh, it, uh, uh, it uh, allows you to visualize on an on event timeline when these events are taking place during the execution of the program. And to give you an example, uh, do you still see the, the shared screen? Inside system, okay. Uh, to give you an example, this is uh, the trace of the phonon simulation that we are running today. 
So basically, uh, this tool, with this tool, you can see uh, in this row all the OpenACC directives uh, that uh, are uh, encountered during the program execution. You can see the CUDA directives, uh, and uh, you can also see this, uh, um, the call to this library named NRUTX, uh, which is used in order to annotate regions of the source code. And uh, in this uh, annotation have uh, uh, a label, uh, which is the same, which corresponds uh, to the name of the routine uh, where, where, the, where, where the label is inserted. So basically with this NVTX, we can see which are the routines that are uh, invoked during the execution of the program. So clearly, you can clearly dis distinguish from here the uh, the the it is a little bit slow. You can clearly distinguish that the code is composed by an initialization region, uh, a main driver named the PHQSCF, uh, and then in this main driver, there is a number of solve linter uh, routines that are invoked for a total number of five. There is indeed one solve linter for each irreducible representation because these are mostly independent calculation that now on one GPU are performed one after the other. Uh, moreover, um, this is from the host side. Here on top, in this row, you can see the amount of time uh, that, oh, sorry, the, the kernels that are uh, actually running on the GPU. So basically, you can see that most of these routines here in the main driver for the computation, for the calculation of one of frequencies at a given queue point, uh, contain kernels that are running on the GPU. Okay, so if you, then we can, one can also, it is a little bit stuck here. The, okay, you can also see which are the CUDA kernels that are uploaded, and uh, you can uh, see that basically most of the routines are offloaded. I left uh, to better understand these some pictures of the uh, trace uh, with references to the routine that we, you have seen previously, such as apply the pot, orthogonal eyes, the divuxias, which are the uh, most relevant routine in the phonon simulation, the phonon pot. Okay, so. Okay, now that we have seen how the code has been offloaded to. Uh, to GPU uh, by using one single GPU. Uh, let's do the exercises in step four and five. So um, first of all, uh, in the next two exercises, we will use uh, pool parallelization and images because uh, these are the uh, parallelization levels that entail the uh, lowest amount of communication. So. Uh, these are quite efficient when running on uh, GPU. So uh, let's start with the step four and let's go to the directory named step four. So here you can see my shell and here on top, you can also see the uh, list of commands that I'm typing in case you miss something. So first of all, um, we need uh, we want to use uh, two GPUs and uh, two MPI ranks, and um, we want to use uh, uh, pool parallelization. Fabrizio yesterday already uh, showed talked about the pool parallelization. So you know that basically when you uh, use two pools, you are distributing the computation on K points on these two pools. Uh, and in particular, now we have 20k points, so we will have a 10 wave vector for each rank uh, mapped to a GPU. So now the workflow is quite simple. You already know that you need, first of all, to copy the input file from step two. Okay, which I don't. I don't have uh, here, sorry, because I didn't do this size, but we copy from the reference. Okay. 
Uh, then you need to copy the folder from step, uh, step one. Okay, and uh, now we need to change the um, eventually the uh, job file. Um, in particular, let's check now the slurm options. Um, in this case, we want to use uh, two tasks per node, and uh, we will ask also uh, for two GPUs. And then we need to specify in the command line that we want to offload, that we want to use uh, two uh, pools. Okay. Okay. So we can uh, submit this job. And then we can wait for result. I will wait uh, a couple of minutes. So if you have questions now, I can check the chat or the AKMD. I don't see questions. And I don't know the flow values of the GPU. So uh, regarding, uh, generally speaking, regarding the um, Tracing tool, you can uh, measure floating point operation on the CPU. You need to, uh, for example, uh, use hardware counters. Uh, so it depends on uh, the uh, it depends on the tool. There are some tools that are able uh, to um, collect also hardware counter by um, if they are properly installed with some uh, external packages, for example, uh, Puppy on the CPU or perf. There are also um, some, um, um, some uh, specific uh, libraries for uh, to count uh, operation on the GPU. For example, uh, um, um, a version of perf for the, uh, for specifically for the GPU. Uh, with the inside system, uh, you can uh, um, you can capture some uh, hardware counter, uh, counter on the CPU, but uh, on the GPU, the uh, amount of hardware counter that you can uh, actually measure is limited. You can do much more with inside compute, which is uh, more specific to analyze the kernels on the GPU. Uh, so I don't know now if the job uh, you're running the jobs. Okay, so maybe now there, okay, the results uh, might be already, maybe. Okay, no, it's still running. However, um, we can just check in the reference folder while we wait for results um, the time of our simulation. So at the very bottom, you know that now you can check for the time of the simulation. And I'm, I'm looking at the output file in the reference folder. So uh, previously, it took about uh, 300, 350 seconds. Now it's taking uh, 211, more or less an efficiency of about 80%. And this thanks to the fact that now we are offloading our job to two GPUs, two pools, uh, instead of a single one. OK? Okay. So let's move now to the next uh, step, step five. So um, in this example, we are running on pools, on two pools. Now uh, I'd like to uh, show you how to use images uh, to, um, to parallelize your job. And in particular, uh, with images in a calculation of the phonon frequencies at a single Q point, we are distributing irreducible representations. Um, in particular, uh, in this specific job, uh, in this specific system, 
we saw that uh, the number of irreducible representation is five. Just for the purpose of the exercise, I'd like you to use four GPUs in order to uh, use a full node. And as uh, I want to distribute the computation of the, uh, the atomic force constants for this, uh, four, um, of these five irreducible representation to four images. Okay, so of course, um, you can imagine that uh, uh, there will be a, uh, an unbalanced distribution of the representation. In particular, uh, we will have rank zero um, computing the dynamical matrix for one representation, the same uh, for rank one and rank two. And according to the distribution protocol uh, in uh, Quantum Espresso, the uh, rank, rank three, the last uh, uh, process, the last image, uh, will uh, um, compute the dynamical matrix for two representation. Okay. So um, when you use, uh, be very careful because uh, when you use uh, images uh, to parallelize your job in the phone simulation, uh, at the end of at the end of the computation, you will not directly. Uh, find the phonon frequencies. So, because with images, you are just distributing the calculation of the uh, interatomic force constants. So, basically, you are distributing these five loop, five uh, invocation to different MPI processes and the GPUs. So, in order to get the phonon frequencies at the end of your simulation, you need to add a step, which is a recover run, that basically, um, and you can do that, uh, you need to do that uh, with one process only. The, in this recover run, basically the process will take the information distributed uh, in the local folder of each image, in the output directory, will gather this information, and then we'll compute the dynamical matrix, diagonalize it, and compute the phonon frequencies. Okay, so uh, do not forget about this additional step that you need when you use images. Now, the workflow is similar to the previous one. Okay. It's similar to the previous one. Let's go to step five folder. And let's copy again the input file from step two with all the information that we need for the phono simulation. Then let's copy this input file and rename it with recover. And we add the option recover equal true. Okay, where we specify that the, the, this run, this input file is for a recover run. Okay, and then let's check our slurm file, sorry, our job file and the slurm options. Now we are asking for uh, four tasks per node and four GPUs because uh, we want to map the problem with one image and one G for one GPU for a total of four. You can decide if you want to run on the reservation queue or not. And then here, as you can see, you have the two um, the two steps needed to use images. In the first one, you need to, uh, to specify with the flag, uh, with the option minus ni, the number of images that you want for in this case. While the second run is a recover run, which takes this input file named ph dot, uh, the, the system dot recover dot in, um, in order to specify that this is a recover run from uh, a previous one, okay? So now it becomes, uh, you need to submit. And let's wait for the result. Um, okay, I'll wait a couple of minutes, up to 50. 
I don't know why there is a crash. <laughs> ah, sorry, because I forgot to copy or the uh, because, okay. the output directory from uh, step one. I hope you didn't forget. Okay, now it's running. So first of all, let me show you uh, this. So as you can see here, uh, in the uh, in the output directory, there are uh, four uh, output files that are named out dot a number, which is the image rank underscore another number, which is the ID of the uh, cue point that we are calculating. Zero because we're calculating only one point, which is the gamma point. Okay. So, um, so in the specific case of an image simulation or a simulation parallelized on images, you will have one output for each image. And from this output, you can check the uh, time taken to achieve the convergence. Okay. It is still running. So let's go to the reference folder. I can check the time taken to uh, do the simulation for each image. So you see here that uh, image zero, image one, and image two are taking more or less the same amount of time, while the last image is taking more uh, time. Uh, can you guess uh, why? Do you have any, any guess? Okay, here. Yeah. Do you know why? Why the last, uh, the third image is taking more time than res with respect to the others? Exactly, Matteo. There are two representations on the third image. Perfect. This is uh, the, the workload is not uh, completely balanced. Uh, there is uh, more work to do uh, for the third image. So, but let's check this because uh, we want to check. If uh, this is true, so in order to see how many, the, basically the workload of each image, you can parse this message in the output files. Let's see what uh, this message is telling us. So, okay, uh, image one, two, and three have one, uh, one and two representation as expected. But to be careful, image zero actually at least from this message, has two representation, zero, which was not mentioned previously, and one. So what is happening here? Uh, you need to take into account that image zero is always doing an extra work in order to compute this part of the diagonal matrix, which is not computed in the solved linter um, routine, but which depend, which, and which does not depend upon the uh, change of the block wave function. So this is an extra work that is done at the very beginning of the simulation. And this extra work is always done by process zero, by image zero. To give you an idea, if we look at the trace here at the beginning, dimmat zero is this green um, uh, range that you can see here within PHQ init. So, uh, and the, the so also this additional extra calculation, which is always done by image zero, must be um, must be taken uh, uh, should, should should be considered when you analyze how the workload is distributed among images. Okay. So, but in this case, the time taken to compute the mass zero is quite small. You can check this here in the output. Uh, in the output at the end, you see that uh, there is this dimmat zero step, which is taking a few seconds and which is done only by image zero. Indeed, if we check in the output file of the first image, for example, there is no dimmat zero. While there is, if we check the output file of the um, image zero. Okay. And uh, if you also check the output file of any image, you won't find, as I said, the, uh, the frequencies because after achieving the convergence, it stops. If you want to 
uh, if you want to measure the uh, to, to, to compute the frequencies, you need to do the recover and then you need to check in the output of the recover run. Okay. Okay, so I hope this clarifies how to use images in order to parallelize the job and run on multiple GPUs. Ah, this is just a final picture to show you how the workload is distributed among the GPUs. Of course, here the, 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 the trace is showing the execution of the solve linter um, routines, in, uh, let's say sequentially. Uh, in a distributed job, you need to think that these are uh, distrib not not uh, distributed and thus executed on parallel. And as I said initially, uh, these computations are rather independent, so the amount of communication is quite low. Here is just a final picture to, um, to, to suggest you to test uh, different uh, parallelization levels by using uh, the pool parallelism, uh, using images, but uh, of course, as I said, be careful because there is all, there might be, uh, um, there is basically a, um, uh, an image which is uh, slower than the other. And the time to solution for this kind of parallelized um, simulation is determined by the slowest image. And then you can also uh, play by mixing um, pool parallelization and image parallelization in order to uh, scale beyond the uh, maximum number of irreducible representation, which is five in this case, and the, um, the maximum number of uh, pools uh, that are uh, available. Okay. Uh, so just a um, just a last slide to tell you that now today we have seen how to implement a single calculation a calculation at a single pool point gamma in this case but it can be uh, any other point um, and uh, but there are many other kind of calculation that you can implement if you want to have an overview of the possible uh, computations you can check here at the link. Uh, which are the options available in the input file of the phone. So I hope uh, you got the result. Uh, I suggest to do a five minute break. Meanwhile, if you have questions, I will reply. Hello, everyone. So my name is Tommaso Gorni, and uh, I will uh, talk about the time dependent density function of theory module, uh, specifically about its implementation for uh, solid systems, which are based on the same linear response module uh, used for phonons. So under the hood, we make calls to uh, the same, if not similar routines. However, this is, it tackles a rather different physical problem. Namely, here we are talking about uh, electronic excitations. So in this in time dependency functional perturbation theory, we are not we are working with the nuclei which are still, uh, but we uh, can actually have access to dynamical susceptibilities, which tells us what are the electronic excitations of our solids. Uh, but with dynamical susceptibilities, I mean uh, we can uh, compute what is the response of a given operator to a given external perturbation. Depending on the operator and the perturbation, we can have access to different kinds of susceptibilities, such as, for example, charge susceptibility or magnetic susceptibility, which can describe uh, rather different uh, uh, inelastic spectroscopies. Here in this uh, tutorial, we show how to compute the charge susceptibility with the turbo yields code, and also to compute spin susceptibility with the turbo magnum codes, which give access to uh, charge and spin excitations in uh, via the time dependent acid functional theory uh, approximations. So uh, Yuri already introduced the theory. Uh, just to resume, what are the equations we're going to solve? Is this set of equations where you are, which are uh, two times the number of band times the number of K points coupled equations. So to make a comparison with the phone case, you have uh, twice as much equations. This is because we are dealing with a problem in which our external perturbation is a, a, some uh, say scalar potential with a given frequency and wave vector Q. So we have a time independent problem. The potential, the perturbation has time independence, which in Fourier space is, becomes a frequency dependence. Therefore, our ground state Konishama orbital will respond 
to this uh, uh, perturbation uh, for each frequency. And actually, in, uh, we have twice the equations because uh, uh, we need to have, uh, one realizes while driving the theory, that one needs to deal with the, the response at uh, the frequency omega and minus omega together. So the size of the problem, say, is twice the size of a linear response problem. Moreover, for each linear response, for each uh, uh, set of equation, we have a given frequency. Therefore, one might think to solve this equation in the same way one did for phonons, which is what uh, I call here the Sternheimer approach, uh, which means we can think of inverting this linear system for each frequency. This allows us to find the unknowns, which are this phi prime, the response orbitals. Uh, with the response orbital, one can have the response density matrix, which is the generalized version of the response density of response magnetization. Uh, and with that, one can compute, one can see what can compute the dynamical susceptibility areas in a reciprocal space. This uh, gives access to, for example, in the charge case, to the Hill's uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy cross section, which is proportional to the imaginary part of. Uh, uh, this uh, response function. Uh, however, this method requires basically to perform a, a linear response calculation for each frequency omega because you have to invert the system for each frequency omega. Uh, therefore, the cost would be the cost of a static linear response uh, problem roughly times the number of frequencies. This can become roughly affordable because uh, suppose that you want to uh, look at what happens for a thousand uh, frequency points, it can become rather expensive. Therefore, the first uh, implementation that was done with the steering quantum espresso was uh, using another approach of solving these very same equations. That is what you introduced, the Langtos approach. The Langtos approach can be seen as just a, a, a recasting this problem as a unique linear problem, which depends on a vector of orbitals that we call batch, this one, which is just a vector formed by all the response orbital resonant and anti-resonant. So the size of this uh, huge vector is uh, uh, twice uh, omega plus, plus omega minus omega uh, times uh, the number of k points, times the number of bands, and times the size of uh, the representation of your orbitals, so the number of plane waves if you are dealing with the plane waves. So uh, with this uh, uh, vector at hand, you can recast uh, all this problem into a linear form that I will put up here. And in the case in which your uh, Uvillian kernel does not depend on frequency, which is, I would say, 99% of the cases which use uh, time dependency in functional theory, you use exchange and correlation potentials which do not depend uh, on frequencies. Uh, so basically, you use the corrective static exchange and correlation potential, such as LDA and GGA. And in those cases, actually, you can make use of uh, iterative algorithms to three-diagonalize, say in the case of Langtos, to three-diagonalize your Louisvillian once and for all, for all the frequencies. And this is done in a specific case with this Louisvillian algorithm. Uh, this algorithm, basically, at each iteration, you apply your Louisvillian operator to uh, a batch, a given batch, and uh, this iteration by iteration uh, give, uh, represent your uh, um, your uh, Liouvillian on uh, this uh, V and U vector, you find a three diagonal form, which has the size of the number of iteration you, you are performing. So if you perform N Liouvillian steps, recursive steps, you will end up with a representation of your Liouvillian of size N, which is three diagonal. This can be done independently of the frequency, that is once and for all for each frequency. And therefore, the inversion can be done in post-processing, uh, uh, at any desired frequency with the advantage, advantage that inverting a three diagonal matrix is uh, totally inexpensive from the computational point of view. And therefore can be done actually, you will see uh, serially on, on um, just uh, as a post-processing on, on a single core. And therefore with that, uh, the computational intensive part will be the generation of the three diagonal uh, matrix represent, or the three diagonal representation. But after that, you can uh, play uh, at, uh, and inspect the spectrum at all given frequencies and also uh, with different broadenings. Uh, you know that uh, uh, these uh, uh, response functions have poles at all the excitation frequency. So to regularize them, we usually put by hand a small imaginary shift. Uh, and this shift can also be adjusted in post-processing. So that this actually, this method uh, gives you a way to uh, inspect uh, more freely the frequency range and the, also the frequency resolution uh, you want to obtain. So 
Uh, how do we therefore uh, how do we run this kind of calculation in the case I will show in the case of the yields spectroscopy that is in case we compute the charge susceptibility uh, the workflow is uh, uh, kind of simple it is similar to, uh, to to phonons first you need to run a self-consistent ground state calculation to get the ground state with wave function for each uh, k point and uh, say blue and zone sampling uh, that you chose. Uh, after that, uh, you run uh, a time dependency function theory calculation. Uh, this uh, actually performs the Langtos algorithm to generate the three diagonal form of your Lewillian. So the output basically here will be just a set of coefficient beta and gamma here that form your three diagonal presentation. And after that, with the tur called the turbo spectrum, you can post process this. Uh, Three diagonal uh, matrix and invert uh, for each uh, frequency, desired frequency to obtain, we go back again, uh, your uh, um, response function for uh, the Q point you chose at the beginning of the calculation and for any desired frequency. Therefore, uh, this last part, uh, we, we provide, when Express is provided uh, the script to make that, but actually can be done uh, even by uh, uh, a Python script you can write to your own, is totally inexpensive, it can be run on any, on any serial machine. So, the, I would move, therefore, to show how to actually run this example. I can check if there are, there are any questions, uh, maybe on, uh, on this short reminder of the theory. In the chat, I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, so what can I say? Let's see, we can move on. And try to perform a calculation. So uh, here. Uh, therefore, uh, so you have all the uh, instructions on the slides. I will try to comment briefly the input files. In the directory example yields, you find all the input files that you need, and also the reference, as done in the previous exercises. And uh, for the first step, as we, as we said, is a ground state calculation. Here we chose as an example bulk silicon, simple structure. So the, the relevant parameter here, you define your system, uh, you've seen like your, the, the, bra, the Brave lattice, the cell parameters, the cutoff, uh, and the K point the structure and the K point sampling. Here we use a 12 times 12 times 12 K mesh. So you can uh, already start and run this uh, uh, ground state calculation. I think this will take a few seconds. I think I'm not seeing the chat of Zoom. So if there are any questions, please uh, also, I'm not answering, tell me something. Okay, or someone else will take care of this. Yeah, I can bring anything up that I see. Okay. And before why the graph state calculation runs, let me comment the uh, input file for the graph for the Langton's calculation, which actually is very simple. So, as you see, there are only two name lists. In the first one, you mention the, all the needed address to find the ground state data, that is what is the prefix of the calculation and the, the temporary directory for the temporary files. Uh, you can, there is a restart option. We are not using it here. So if, you, if your Langtos uh, iteration breaks after a certain, uh, I mean, stops after a certain number of iteration, you can uh, restart actually by putting restart through. And this will start from the, last save iteration. Here we save, for example, every 250 iteration. This can be kind of expensive uh, in, uh, as, a, as a right to disk. Uh, so, so, I mean, just try to uh, write the less you can, less often you can. Uh, this uh, name list, the R, R controls, actually is where the Langtus is defined. You simply need to specify the number of Langtus iteration, which is the size in the end of your three diagonal uh, representation of the Lubillian. And the Q, you specify also the Q point of your external perturbation. So, uh, of course, uh, your, this is, uh, as in phonon, uh, each calculation uh, gives you the susceptibility at a given Q vector.
in the meanwhile, if you see my screen, I will try also to run it together with you. To see if everything works. Can I still calculation? Take just a few seconds. So let's this calculation. Let's have a look at the output file. What is that? Okay, here you see these are the length of iterations going on. So for the chosen system, this is actually really fast. We set, I think, 2000 iterations, so it will take uh, just a minute. And you see that for each iteration, the alpha, beta, and gamma coefficients of the trigger diagonal matrix are reported. As you see, alpha is zero because uh, you can actually did I mention you can take advantage of the symmetries of your uh, revillian and uh, here we are explicitly using uh, time reversal symmetry to actually reduce of a factor of uh, two the size of our revillian and this also guarantees us that the alpha coefficients are zero at the iteration so the only meaningful coefficients are the off diagonal ones which are the beta and the gamma Yeah, I think it's nearly finished. Okay, so this is done. Now we have our, let me go back to the slide. If I can. Okay. So the last step of the workflow is therefore to post process this. Uh, uh, Tridiagonal matrix and invert omega minus the tridiagonal matrix for any desired frequency. Here, this is this is the input file of a turbo spectrum, which does exactly this operation. What you need to specify here, part the flag is true, that tells us that we are post-processing a charge susceptibility uh, calculation. We need also to specify the units, which uh, is one, one corresponds to electron volt, and it is the only unit system supported by uh, eels. Uh, this is also because uh, the typical charge excitations are in the range of tens of electron volts. So this is also the best unit normally to use. Iter max zero is the number of uh, iteration you, uh, you, 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 Chose, I mean, you actually uh, performed uh, a length of iterations, a length of calculation. Therefore, it, in our case, it's 2000. And you see here that you have also an intermax. Uh, this is actually the possibility to extrapolate this coefficient. To better explain this, uh, you can look at the, this picture on the top right. And uh, here I, I'm tracing the beta coefficient and the gamma, which are the same, uh, for all the 2000 iterations we made. And I divided the even and odd iteration. So it's well known in this kind of problems that uh, you see after a first equilibration uh, period, the uh, two uh, even and odd coefficient, the, co the coefficient corresponding to even and odd iteration, start to oscillate around uh, mean values, which are different for uh, the odd and the even iterations. And therefore, it was found that the co convergence can be accelerated by extrapolating actually this coefficient um, at their average value. Therefore, if uh, I set, for example, here, uh, Iter max 0, 2000, iter max 10,000. It means uh, compute uh, the spectrum using a Revillian in which the 2000 uh, coefficients, the first 2000 coefficients, are taken to be the one I computed, and uh, then use uh, uh, 8000 coefficients, which are just constant average value for the even and the odd iteration. This operation is performed uh, by the Turbo Spectrum uh, tool if you specify uh, extrapolation 
OS, which means oscillating, and ethermax larger than ethermax zero. Um, this, of course, uh, uh, this entails some approximations, uh, which uh, actually are, have been shown in the case of charge sensitivity to be uh, totally negligible if you run a decent number of iterations, uh, uh, of two iterations before. So these are actually the two uh, key parameters you have to monitor uh, to, to look for convergence in this kind of Langtus calculation. Uh, you, you need to uh, check that uh, your spectrum is converged with respect to the uh, number of Langtus iterations. Uh, last uh, uh, keyword is the uh, epsilon is the Lorentz is the Lorentzian broadening you will use to broaden the spectrum, the imaginary shift, and this is for historical reason is in Rydberg, so beware it's not in EV but it's in Rydberg uh, atomic units. And finally, you define in EV the uh, frequency grid you want to uh, invert your Lovillian. For here, we start from zero electron volt uh, up to 50 electron volt with uh, a step of 0 0.05 electron volts. All this for actually a rather quick calculation, we will see because we can submit the job. Spectrum. So what? So what is been done is been done now is actually this last step here. Here we are inverting this system where the T of matrix T of n has the first n coefficients, which are the two thousand we computed. Then we have extrapolated with a constant value the uh, other eight thousand coefficients, and we invert this system for uh, the, the frequency grid specified from 0 to 50 with uh, an epsilon of uh, the 0.035 Rydberg. This will give us the uh, chi for the charge sensitivity for the Q point we have specified in the input file and all the frequencies of uh, the grid. Excuse me, Tommaso, there are two yes. comments, questions in the chat. So yes, uh, OK. If you could have a look, or I can read them out. Okay, yes, so I see. Uh, okay, Oscar says, uh, on the choice of the Q point, the transfer momentum. Uh, what if there is no experimental value available? Uh, so actually, uh, indeed, uh, transfer momentum uh, is chosen normally to compare to, uh, to an experiment. Uh, for, uh, that depends on the kind of spectroscopy we're dealing with. So the... Um, when we talk about in spectroscopy, the Q is the transfer momentum from an electron which impinges on a sample. And so you measure the momentum of the electron before uh, impinging on the sample and the momentum of the electron uh, after uh, colliding with the sample and the difference is this Q. Uh, normally, these Q are actually taken along the high symmetry path of the Brillouin zone, both experimentally and uh, and, and theoretically, one uh, ten, uh, tends to look at what happens along the high symmetry direction of the Lorentz zone. So Q uh, can go, so in principle, be larger, go out of your first Lorentz zone. But I say 90% of the cases, you you look what happens along the high symmetry direction of the Lorentz zone. Uh, also, because in the case of, uh, for example, spin excitation, uh, you can have your collective excitation, your magnons, which actually disperse, and so can actually uh, draw a dispersion uh, along the asymmetric direction, which is uh, what you normally would like to look at. What second question? Can I have a bit on what this can be used for? Uh, yes, so the susceptibility, so the imaginary part of the susceptibility I went fast on the first slide, is the imaginary part of the susceptibility is related to cross-section of inelastic spectroscopies. So uh, to make an example, if uh, you compute uh, your dipole-dipole susceptibility, you would have uh, access to optical solution spectroscopy. So what happens if you shine uh, light uh, on your sample, which kind of excitations uh, you, uh, electronic excitation you produce in your sample. If you uh, compute, like in the case we are doing, uh, uh, um, charge susceptibility, this uh, uh, gives you access to uh, the dynamical charge fluctuations. So, uh, namely, uh, this, this, which can be uh, 
independent particle excitations or uh, collective excitations such as plasmons, which are uh, normally uh, probed by different spectroscopy, such as electron and geo spectroscopy of inelastic X-ray scattering. So you have access also uh, to these collective modes of your charge and as well to collective modes of your magnetization. Uh, this we will see in the last part uh, of the presentation. If you look at the collective mode of the, of the magnetization, uh, you have access to, for example, magnos or spin waves. Uh, so you can have the energy of your spin, allowed spin waves or the allowed spin waves mode at a given um, uh, energy and momentum transfer. And therefore, uh, with that, then you can build uh, uh, much more uh, physics, of course. But uh, the the ingredient we have access to is our dynamical susceptibilities. I don't know if I answered. Okay, well, as on the about the end zone part, uh, I don't know if you were all able to launch the example. Okay, in the end, uh, the code will produce uh, two output files, which are the plot underscore chi dot uh, dot, in which you have uh, uh, actually the, the chi, the susceptibility itself. So you see here you have uh, the frequency grid you computed, and for each value of the frequency, the real and the imaginary part of your uh, charge response function. And also for actually to compare with experiments, sometimes you prefer to work with the epsilon, the electric constant, which is actually a simple function of chi, and it's uh, uh, written in the dot plot underscore epsilon dot phi. So here you see you have uh, also one over epsilon and epsilon. Uh, and indeed, uh, for the electron energy loss uh, uh, spectroscopy, the relevant quantity is the imaginary part of one over epsilon, which is uh, proportional to the cross section of this spectroscopy. So, in the reference folder, you have uh, uh, we provided a script to plot uh, uh, with GNU plot this uh, this function, and you should be able to see here it is this result if everything runs correctly. So here I'm tracing the imaginary part uh, one over epsilon its imaginary part as a function of the frequencies and this is exactly uh, the frequency grid we, we've chosen before from 0 to 50 with the pace uh, with the step uh, 0.05 and and each point has been obtained by inverting the uh, three diagonal representation of the Lewillian. Uh, the uh, say homework I can leave you with is to check actually the convergence of this spectra as a function of the length of iteration. Here we start 2000, which is uh, for this kind of problems uh, and this kind of uh, cutoffs as well is more than enough. Uh, but uh, you can try to look at what happens if you compute the spectrum for 200, 400, 600 length of iteration and try to see when it converges. And try to see also if uh, uh, what happens if you extrapolate or not extrapolate the length of recursion. In the end, you need to find a, a, a a converged spectrum like this one when you reach uh, uh, in at length of iterations. So, are there any more questions about the workflow? Because uh, that is the basic idea. And uh, in the next uh, few minutes, I'm going just to present uh, the same workflow, but to perform. Uh, uh, magnetic susceptibility calculations. So I will just comment on the little differences that are, that there are between the two cases. No questions, so. Uh, here, just uh, a recap slide of what are the features uh, implemented in Quantum Espresso for the Turbo Is code. And uh, just to mention that uh, it's implemented for 
no magnetic systems only at present, but you can use spin orbit coupling in the paramagnetic case. And moreover, about the parallelization level, so uh, we have uh, the uh, normal Fourier transform parallelization and also band par um, K point parallelization, the pool parallelization, and which you will see, you can try to see yourself normally is the most effective ones when you start to have a, a K points. Uh, and the suggestion is to parallelize as much as you can over the K points. Uh, moreover, since, uh, as I told you, this uh, uh, code relies. Uh, on a similar engine of the uh, phone package, uh, it supports uh, uh, GPU offloading. Uh, this, unfortunately, the size of the examples we are showing you is too little to see an advantage, but you can, uh, but you can also try and uh, uh, by loading the uh, uh, quantum espresso modules that you use for the exercise with, uh, with Laura on phones, uh, which supports GPU offloading, you can try and run the code on, on GPUs. And, you will see that it actually uh, can perform uh, on GPU. OK, so I will move to the last uh, just five minutes uh, to, uh, to comment that uh, we can also compute with the same method, uh, actually spin uh, excitation, spin fluctuations. The, the equation we saw actually are the same. And you just need to formalize a little uh, better for the case of spin because we use spinors. Therefore, uh, this, uh, now these uh, uh, orbitals are actually have a spin up and a spin down component. And instead of the complex conjugation operator, uh, you use the time reversal operator for, uh, uh, which is uh, more the conju conjugation is a particular representation of the time reversal operator when you work with uh, uh, scalar wave functions. Um, with this at end, uh, we have in the end the same set of equations, uh, just twice the size because we have uh, spin up and spin down component. But we can uh, play the same game, recast again uh, everything as a linear problem, and use uh, the same technique to solve. Uh, just uh, one thing more, now we have the alpha coefficients because we don't have a time reversal anymore when we deal with magnetic systems. Therefore, uh, Langstroth's uh, recursion will have also non-zero alpha coefficients. And uh, uh, finally, when we invert the Liouvillian, now we have a tensor and not a scalar uh, response function because uh, we are dealing with a spin-spin response function, meaning that we apply a magnetic field along a Cartesian direction, and we look at the charge response along another direction. So it's a three times three tensor. We have the XX component, which is the magnetization response for a, a magnetic field along the X direction uh, of the magnetization along the X direction, and the XY component, and so on. So uh, each, what's important it, is that each Langstroth recursion fixes not only a Q vector here, but also a direction of the external magnetic field. So for each Langstroth recursion, you compute a column of this tensor. So if you want, if you need uh, all the three times three tensor, you need to perform three Langstroth recursions. But this is uh, uh, seldom the case. Therefore, the Workflow to compute Magnum with the Turbo Magnum code is the same. You run a ground state calculation, you run uh, the Langstroth recursion for the uh, spin polarized case, and in the end, you invert uh, your uh, system for uh, with the uh, Turbo Spectrum. Uh, just exactly bear in mind that uh, here you will have to invert the system uh, three times uh, to perform three trigonalization to have the whole tensor if you want the full magnetic susceptibility tensor. So uh, since we are short of time, I leave as an exercise to try and run the Magnon uh, spectrum of uh, iron, of ferromagnetic iron. You find in the slides all the description, but the workflow is identical. Uh, just a warning that here we are dealing with the, so a magnetic system. So in the ground state calculation, you will see that you have to uh, initialize uh, magnetization to have uh, a spin polarized solution. And also uh, the Magnon case, the uh, symmetry, uh, the use of symmetries for the blue and zone is not implemented. So you have to force uh, the, the to not to use the symmetries at the ground state level. So this no semi equal true, no equal true uh, tells you that to the um, 
ground state code not to use symmetries. This means that you will have a lot of k points because you will have all the k points you ask, that is, you have a four times four times four. These are not uh, reduced with symmetries. And moreover, you have to specify that we are dealing with a non collinear calculation. Okay, so uh, for the lactose calculation, the input is the same. Uh, you specify the number of lactose iteration, the Q point you want to compute your response function, uh, and this I poll. This is actually the, um, uh, the, the column of the susceptibility, uh, magnetic susceptibility tensor you want to compute. So in this case, we will compute the Y column of your susceptibility tensor. Uh, pseudo emission equal true is a particular flavor of lactose recursion who uses, exploits a particular pseudo emission symmetry of the Lewillian. And uh, I actually, uh, I suggest you always to use that because uh, this gives you a, um, factor of two speed up with the lactose recursion. Finally, for the post-processing, same keyword than in this case, uh, just need to specify units three, because here we use milli electron volt because typical magnetic excitations are in the, uh, are in, in the milli electron volt range, and the electron volts are therefore used in all the other uh, energy uh, cases. So uh, for the broadening, it is in electron volt, and the, the uh, frequency grid is specified in electron volts. So this will uh, generate a file uh, which contains uh, the three elements of your column for the chi uh, one, two, the, uh, the chi two, two, and the chi uh, three, two element of your magnetization. With this command that is reported here, you can extract the diagonal element, which in this particular case for uh, symmetry reasons is uh, proportional to uh, your uh, in the last neutron scattering cross section, and you can trace the imaginary part of the uh, chi yy element to see uh, the two, to see uh, the magnetic susceptibility. Uh, just uh, another word of caution: you see that here we need uh, normally an order of magnitude more iterations. Uh, this is due uh, again to the fact that, uh, unfortunately, we want to resolve a very uh, smaller frequency uh, range with respect to uh, the cutoffs we use in the ground state calculation. So uh, a higher resolution means also more lactose iteration. You will see that normally you need uh, an order of magnitude more iterations than in the charge response case. Uh, however, I invite you also to play here with the, with the convergence of the iterations and not bother too much with the extrapolation because uh, in these particular examples, you will see is uh, practically useless. You need to you have uh, only a magnum peak at low frequency, which you need to converge uh, just using your true lactose iterations. So. With that, here is just a uh, find a recap again of what's implemented. Uh, beware that here no symmetry is used. So we'll have uh, actually a lot of k points. And this is why it's also uh, a good choice to parallelize over k points uh, because you will always have many, many. And also, uh, Magnum case, uh, you benefit of a GPU offloading, uh, even though. We'll see uh, again only for a larger system than the one we propose here. So with this, uh, this is everything I wanted to show you. So I leave the Magnum case for uh, uh, for exercise and also to check the convergences with respect to lactose iterations. If there are any questions, I'll uh, I'm, I will answer or live or in the chat. Uh, okay, hello everybody uh, or everybody who's left. Uh, thanks a lot for staying. Uh, I will now uh, yes. Let's see. Uh, I am Francisco from EPFL. Uh, I'm part of the developer team for AIDA. And in this next uh, 30 minutes of so or so, I'm going to try to show you a bit what our code does and how it can help you in your research. Uh, for that, I would like to start with a bit of context, maybe. And uh, all of you, uh, are probably aware of the increasing uh, power in computational resources that uh, we have been living ever since the invention of the microchip. Uh, every year we have more and more resources available. Uh, this uh, allows us to perform more complex calculations, what is typically the high performance computing view of being able to do 
uh, more complex systems uh, and uh, faster, bigger systems also. But there is also a, an alternative view of this that is more the high throughput computation view. That is, you can do more extensive sampling of your data. So you can run many more calculations simultaneously. Uh, of course, the line division between this is kind of fuzzy sometimes, but uh, this is the basic idea. And uh, all of this increase in computational resources is, in principle, a good thing, but it also comes at the cost somehow of the pressure that uh, we research scientists have to take advantage of all of these resources and manage them. Uh, because, of course, uh, science, uh, there's also another big important part of the context that is the general reproducibility crisis that exists in science. Uh, this is from uh, a publication from a couple of years ago, uh, but things haven't changed drastically from then. You can see that there is a, a, a very great amount of people who have difficulties reproducing not only other researchers' work, but also their own work. Uh, this, uh, in experimental disciplines, uh, one can understand that there are some uh, more difficulties, like the partial knowledge they have of, of their system. They don't always know every variable involved. Uh, in reality, that's how like new theories about uh, matter get invented. And, uh, and also they have the reliability of the environment, right? So controlling temperature, uh, uh, oxygen exposure, all of this stuff. Here in computational disciplines, we have a tighter control of our systems, and there is a more method, like a more determinism to our methodologies. So we do have a more opportunities to to control all of this, and even so, we have similar problems reproducing our research and other people's research. And this is mostly, from our view, an issue of data management, and. Uh, as, as we increase the resources, the computational resources we have uh, access to, and as we are producing more and more data, uh, this problem would get uh, worse, obviously. It's like uh, throwing gasoline to the fire. So this is where our cause comes from. This is what we are trying to deal with. Uh, and we are trying to do this by with two different pillars, let's say. The first one, is to have efficient data management uh, that provides an automated tracking of the full data provenance. I will go in a few seconds more into detail what, what, what I mean by data provenance. But for now, let's just take the general idea of the history of, of your research calculations, of the calculations that you're running. Uh, all of this data has to be discoverable, and uh, the, the analysis of your data has to be easily enabled. Uh, by by querying languages, for example, there has to be a logging of the calculations and the environment in which the calculations are run, so that we have complete information of of the context of these calculations. And there has to exist some flexible integration between uh, our program, our service, and the other services that uh, you have in your computer, like databases, your database setup, your file repository, etc. So that can be used in many different contexts. On the other hand, we have to have a robust workflow automation in order to keep track of all of these simulations that we want. To. It has to be automated and high performance scheduling and execution of local and remote resources. So you have to be able to automatically manage the resources that you have access to. So you don't have to go on like the different clusters, copying files, keeping everything synchronized, etc. It has to be centralized. Uh, it has to provide a language to define complex workflows that codify the scientific workflows and include uh, things such as built-in error handling. So uh, we have to provide the language to facilitate the scripting of workflows that take many steps. Uh, just now, before this morning, you were performing in order to calculate a final uh, a final property. You were had to do many steps along the way, so it's it would be much easier if those were codified into script and run automatically. And of course, it has to be set up in an expandable system that can sustain independent, uh, independent plugins that are easy to design, package, and distribute, so that not all of the workload falls 
into the core distribution because there are millions of codes, millions of potential applications. We want to be able for scientists, for experts in computational disciplines to create their own workflows and uh, distribute them uh, easily. So then what do I mean by data provenance? This is a concept that is important to understand because it's at the core of what AIDA is. And uh, this is a concept that comes from the open provenance model where basically you can, we think of each independent piece of data as represented by a data node. So for example, a crystal structure, a charge distribution, a set of parameters that you use to run a program, all of these would be different data nodes. And then each transformation of a group of data nodes into another is represented by a calculation node. So for example, performing a simulation is transforming an initial data node with uh, the structure, the crystal structure of the system and a set of parameters into an output, uh, a relaxed density. Uh, therefore, the data that is derived from pre-existing information has a record of its origin, thanks to the connection to the calculation node. And so we can always track down where each piece of data comes from. A more concrete example of this is uh, if we take uh, the first uh, workflow that you did uh, this morning with Yuri, uh, where you run this PhD, uh, sorry, PhD calculation. Um, the first thing you do was to perform a PW calculation. And you can think of this as a starting with a PW in, uh, input and a, a pseudo folder where you have your pseudo potentials as two separate inputs. These are not the exact same data inputs that uh, the PW code uses, but just as an example, it will serve for now. And then uh, producing the pw.out file with all of the information of the output and the .out uh, folder with all of the intermediate values for the calculation. And then when you wanted to perform the ph.x uh, part of the calculation, you use the same uh, out folder that was an output of the pw as an input of the ph and also a, a different set of parameters. And then you obtain the ph.out and all of other uh, information from the phonon calculation. So you see here how uh, we can think of this process and how the connection between nodes work. Compare this with what you probably did, that is like put all of your files in two different folders. So you have one folder where you put all the files of the PW calculation and a different folder where you put the files of the ph calculation. Then you run the PW and then copy the dot out folder to the next folder in order to execute the next one. But essentially, uh, this connection that says that the, that establishes what the relationship is between these two outputs and between these two calculations, uh, where is this? It's uh, nowhere. It's, it's stored in your mind, right? This is in your memory, which is arguably the, the worst kind of RAM that there is. So uh, that's very fragile, and we would and having the provenance allows us to keep a, a tracking of this information concretely. Now, uh, you, you might say that, okay, uh, you can keep uh, this in your memory. It, uh, it That's a bad idea. You can write it down. You can take notes. But this uh, quickly becomes unsustainable as the calculations become more and more complex. This is an example of the data provenance of a workflow to calculate a, a single property. I believe, was, I believe it was some elasticity or something like this, but you see that there are thousands, like uh, hundreds of nodes, and it becomes even more serious when you are considering high throughput calculations, right? Where you are wanting to submit thousands of, of thousands of different materials to compute uh, one or two properties of thousands of materials. This here is not a piece of abstract art. This is the a, a nice representation of what a database that has thousands of materials uh, being used to calculate some advanced properties looks like, where every every little single one of these uh, red items is a node, and these are showing all of the connections between those nodes. This is impossible to keep track manually. So here is uh, where AIDA comes from. What is AIDA? AIDA, it's a Python library that is pip installable. You can just uh, create a work environment and pip install it. Uh, it is an it has an open source MIT license. Uh, 
uh, you can find the source code here in the GitHub. Uh, and it has many interfaces, it has many resources, many tools to perform computations. We will take a look at a few uh, right now. And it has many interfaces with which you can interact with. Uh, we will be looking mostly as the, at the Python ORM that uh, each interface serves a different purpose. The Python ORM is good for designing the workflows and preparing your calculations. Uh, and, uh, and we'll also see at the Verdi CLI, the command line the interface that is good for submitting these calculations and controlling how are they run. Uh, this is a general representation of, uh, of what AIDA looks like or used to look like. There has been some changes in the most recent version, but essentially these are uh, the interfaces we just talked about. And so you can understand, uh, so that you are able to understand. Internally, AIDA keeps track of all of this information by using a database and a file repository. The database, uh, with, among other stuff, uh, keeps track of all of the connections between the nodes and any of the most critical uh, critical information that one has wants to have easy access to. And then uh, the file repository is for storing all of the important uh, information that might be bigger, uh, such as, for example, all of the concrete inputs that are used to run the, the code. Uh, so when the data nodes are turned into an input file that is read by the code, a copy of that uh, file is stored on the file system, for example. Now, uh, in order to better understand AIDA, uh, for me, the best way is to see how it works. Uh, for this, I'm going to show you a brief demo because uh, always uh, demos, nothing ever goes wrong with uh, showing live demos. So it's a great idea. It's going to be loosely based on a tutorial we have. So if you go to the AIDA tutorials page, you have many tutorials there. I'm going to be using one of the latest one, this uh, quantum expression introductory tutorial. If you go into the page a couple of months from now, maybe if there are new ones, you will have the, this will be displaced by other ones and you have to look it in the sidebar. But one advantage that we have with our tutorials is that we include a, a virtual machine a quantum, called Quantum Mobile that you can download and use uh, either as a Docker container or as a virtual box, a virtual machine. And you can run the tutorial inside of it. It's already prepared, has all of the setups ready, so you can just start uh, running the tutorials. Um, Okay. Wait, let's. Uh, well, there's a problem with the slide, but uh, never mind because this was just to show you uh, that uh, the, for the example, the virtual machine comes already with some of the codes set up that we will now uh, see. And uh, Let's see if this one knows work. No, okay. I will have to change the strategy for the next. Okay, and and then of course uh, we're going to run a quantum espresso work uh, workflow or calculations. So if you if you want to have more information about how to run this, there is the Aida Quantum Espresso plugin, which is the extension that Aida can use to run quantum espresso calculations. There is one for quantum espresso, but there's also uh, different ones for different codes. I think in particular, they are also for Yambo and Big DFT that are the other codes that you will be seeing on this workshop. But let's uh, let's now try seeing how this works in person. Okay, so I hope everybody can see my screen now. Uh, here I'm inside of a virtual machine that has AIDA installed. And you can see that if I do the, the command to list all of the already set up codes is Verdi code list. And you can see all of the codes available. There is uh, some FLIR, big DFT, but we are interested in all of the quantum espresso. You see here that they are installed into the local host, but you can set up codes that are installed in remote clusters. And this works exactly the same way. There's is a difference uh, when you have to set them up, but for the rest works in the same way. 
so we have the code uh, here and we want to run uh, let's say an SCF calculation with the same uh, crystal structure uh, material that you were using in the previous example. I have here uh, the input that you were using and AIDA among the other tools that it has. Uh, well, the first thing that we need to do first, uh, the explanation, the first thing that we have to do is have the nodes into uh, recognized by AIDA because this is an input file that exists outside of AIDA. So we need to upload this into AIDA. We have to convert this into a structure node in order to be able to use that structure node to perform the calculations. AIDA comes with many tools to create nodes. Uh, the one that we're going to use here is an import uh, tool. Uh, in particular, in this case, it's this one. It doesn't matter all the details, but uh, you run it. There's a command to run it through Verde the interface. And if I just copy the file here, AIDA automatically can parse this Quantum Espresso file and turn it into a structure node. So it says successful struct, uh, imported structure, and it gives me a PK. PKs are the identifier by which all of the nodes that exist in the database are identified, right? So this is the number that we will have to make reference if we have to then ask AIDA to do something with this node. In the same way that we have the PKs here for the codes, and if we want to use, for example, this PW code of Quantum Espresso, we'll have to reference it using this PK. Now for the following, these were a couple of commands using the Verdi command line. For the following, I'm going to use the Verdi shell. What the Verdi shell is essentially is a, an interactive Python shell. So uh, instead of having to write the whole script and run the whole script at once, we can run every, we can use this to run a single commands of the script and it will keep everything loaded into the memory. So we can basically do a script step by step essentially. But this, what we are going to use here is Python language. So everything we use here can then be written into script and run directly. So the first thing that we want to do, there are many ways to set up a calculation. The way we're going to do this here is uh, by um, loading the code. So I'm going to use this load code function and I'm going to use to identify the code, the PK that appears here. So seven for the PW calculation. And we have this code object now that represents uh, this uh, executable that lives in a given machine. Now we're going to get a builder from the code, which essentially is a, another object that facilitates the procedure of preparing the calculation for submission. So now that you have the builder, uh, the builder has different, what we call ports, that are uh, different places where we can put the input nodes that we're going to use in order to set up the calculation to then submit it uh, and run it. So uh, the first one we want to set up is the structure, but then we need to load the structure here again. Oh, sorry. As we loaded the code, we also need to load the structure. And for this, again, we use the PK that was given to the structure here, 442. And now basically this structure variable contains the node uh, that contains the structure. So how do we do now to insert this into the builder? We select the structure port and we give it the structure and now this structure port contains the same structure node. Now we need to fill up the rest of these uh, ports that contain the rest of the input nodes necessary for the calculation and uh, what are these, uh, these uh, required nodes. First we need the pseudopotentials, right? So for the pseudopotentials uh, we already have, uh, uh, just as the codes were already set up, we also already have uh, set up in this uh, virtual machine 
a, a family of pseudo potentials. In this case, we just need to load them. We load the, the family like this. You see here, this is not, not a big deal. This is just a warning uh, for deprecations because uh, uh, sometimes as we add new features, we like to keep everything backwards compatible, but we add some deprecations warning. So you can take care of this at your own pace. Then we have to select from this pseudo family the pseudo potentials that are specific for the structure that we want to use. Again, you see that we have a, a utility functions to perform most of the tasks, tasks necessary to set up. Uh, these pseudos uh, now contain the pseudo potentials that we need. As you can see, they are also stored in their respective data nodes. And uh, finally, we just insert this into the builder. Uh, very well, we have the super potentials. What else we need? We need the K points. Uh, the way we're going to create the K points is first getting the class that manages K points. Uh, right now I'm showing you different ways in which we manage, create and manage data nodes that we need in order to perform these calculations. So we imported the structure. Uh, we selected the pseudo potentials from, from a group. We are now creating manually a K point object and we are setting it to be a grid of, I think you use eight by eight by eight. And then finally, setting the K points into the builder. Now here you can see what I meant uh, before, where in the input for Quantum Espresso, the input file, you typically have in the same file, the structure, the parameters, the K points. And here that you see that for AIDA, these are different data nodes that are independent, but you know, when it has to submit the, the Quantum Espresso calculation, it will take the information in all of these nodes and it will put it together into an input that then will use to run the calculation. Speaking of which, what we are missing now are the parameters. So the way we're going to do this is uh, creating a dictionary. This is a, a Python dictionary. You see here, it contains all the parameters. I think you were using uh, 80 and 320. Uh, we're going to run an SCF type of calculation. You were used to running a, a VC Relax. You can just change it here. But for us, this is going to suffice. This is this parameters is now a, a variable in Python, a Python dictionary. But if we want to turn this into a node, we let's say parameters node. We use a, an AIDA a class that con, that is a data node that contains dictionaries, and we pass the parameters dictionary. And now you can see that parameters node is a dictionary is a is a node of that dictionary and you see that this is unstored because we are just we just uh, created it and if we store it it is now stored into the database finally and has its own pk so we can provide this to the parameters and now we are almost ready to submit the calculation. Uh, we need to provide just a few resources that uh, say, for example, how many nodes of the computer, of the external computer we want to use, how many processors we want to use. And then it's just importing a submit a command from the appropriate place and submitting the calculation. And this already submitted a calculation we can now get out of here of the interactive shell interface and do for example verdi process list which is a command and we can see here well i, I had some previous uh, uh, jobs running which i submitted a couple of hours ago but you can see 20 seconds ago we submitted uh, our calculation that is running and uh, basically 
uh, yes, uh, running uh, into the, the respective computer. So uh, this is, uh, let's say, very nice. Uh, probably as an initial thing, a bit overwhelming of, uh, because of all of the steps, you can ask, uh, well, OK, this seems a bit too complicated to, uh, to run a single calculation, which is somewhat true. The good thing about AIDA is that everything that we did is, is a Python command. This is scriptable. You can then, and, and we offer extra features to create more complex kind of scripts called work chains that represent the full workflow of steps. And you can actually, for example, uh, if we go back to the Verdi shell, you can run a whole process like this. I can, uh, Let's do, I'm going to load back the structure that we used and the, the code. Okay. And now if you want to run, for example, if you want to obtain a, a, a event structure for this, it typically takes a lot of calculations. You have to first uh, relax the 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 charge density you have to perform a relaxation of the structure for example if you would like to get to the to the ground state so in order uh, if you want to do this with aida all you need to do is load the correct work chain in this case the pw bands work chain this is the identifier inside of aida that allows you to get uh, the class easily. Uh, again, this is just a deprecation warning that we can ignore for now. And we can just use a get builder from protocol method from this class. And we just provide the code and we just provide the structure. And this already does all of the steps that we just did to set up the builder are automatically performed. And believe me that this builder is much more complicated than the one that we saw previously. It has a lot of more inputs, a lot of more steps, all of those necessary to perform this uh, bands calculation. But now that we have used this feature, all we need to do is load again the submit uh, method and submit the builder. Uh, okay, this okay. And this is done. So now uh, I accidentally submitted it twice, but if you see the list of processes, you will see that we have our newly submitted bands work chain. And uh, this automatically will calculate the band structure for you. So let me go back to the presentation. Uh, so this is what we did. Essentially, you have here in the in the slides a bit what we did, and you can easily then obtain finally the band structure. This is the the band structure that comes as an output. You just need to run a Verdi command in order to transform it into a PDF. And this is what you obtain. Um, uh, yes. Now, uh, this is very good because then it now enables us to, to go further on this, on this like workflow system and uh, generate what we call uh, modular turnkey solutions that can be used even by non-experts to obtain physical properties using the available or preferred software and the available resources without needing to, to manually tweak any parameters uh, themselves. So in a way, we're trying to separate the usage of all of these computational resources from the know-how in order to, to set up uh, the specifics of all of these codes. 
Uh, this is what we're doing in, for example, the Common Workflows project, where a particular uh, emphasis is placed on the modular part. So we want to be able to essentially use the same workflows for any kind of uh, software. What I showed you was, uh, for example, specific from Quantum Espresso, but we want to have even more generalizable workflows that can be used. You can set them up with Quantum Espresso or with any of the other uh, softwares that are participating in this project. Uh, this task uh, is a very difficult effort that uh, requires the coordination of the developers from all the different plugins and simulations and simulation codes that are in, that are uh, involved in the projects in this project. It requires uh, the analysis and the understanding of what in the essence of these computational methods is and how to generalize this uh, to a set of inputs that is common to all of the codes without having to go into the specifics of each of these codes. Uh, and uh, it's right now it's 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 working. You can uh, get it uh, here is the the GitHub where you can get more information also. Uh, and it runs like this. You can just load the class of the common workflows, load the structure, set up some generic uh, parameters, uh, and then you get your builder and you can submit your builder. And by changing the specific uh, keyword here and the, the specific code that you're using for a different one, you can run this in Siesta, in Quantum Espresso, uh, in uh, Big DFT, et cetera. And if you want to have more control over the specifics because you are a computational expert, you can still do manual uh, interactions on the builder the way we did it before, uh, before making the submission and, uh, and set the parameters as you want. Uh, there is also a, an, a kind of command line interface to submit some of the already set up uh, examples. And uh, just to mention that one of the important applications of this, we already used it to compare uh, the performance and the accuracy of results that are obtained with the different codes and was already useful to identify some issues uh, with the pseudo potentials that some of these codes were using. And after improving these pseudo potentials, uh, the performance and the accuracy of many of these codes actually improved. So it's actually a tool that can help to, to improve uh, uh, the underlying codes for all of this. Uh, of course, uh, the reason that we can do all of this is uh, this modularization of AIDA. And uh, well, here is uh, also um, uh, the publication of the common workflows. Uh, in case you want to check it out, here is the reference. There's more information there. But I was saying all of this thanks to the community, the AIDA community that is uh, spread out over many institutions all over Europe uh, and uh, that are help us in maintaining all of the available plugins for all of the different codes. This is something that we would not be able to do just ourselves. Uh, and uh, also thanks of course to all of the funding. Uh, there's a lot of interest uh, in using AIDA as a platform because uh, Funding agencies and, and projects are more and more interested in the aspect of uh, uh, data maintenance, the reliability of the results, uh, the insurance that uh, things will be reproducible in the future, et cetera. Uh, and AIDA is one of the few to tools that can so uh, attempt uh, to, to do this. Uh, but I hope uh, I have convinced you that uh, this is could be useful for you and your research. Uh, these are a few references now. Uh, the, the website of AIDA, where you find links to other places, the documentation, the source code, and contact information for me in case you have any other, uh, you want in case you want to get in touch. Uh, that's it. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions.